Hello, everybody. I believe we're going to sit for a minute to let people turn up. And then we'll do some introductions. Tani, can you see? I'm not used to being this side. Can you see people have turned up? Yeah, we can see people coming in. If we just give it a minute, we'll wait until everybody's here. Okay. Yeah. Just waiting for everybody to fill in. The numbers just keep going up and up and up. <laughs> feel like we started to get enough numbers that we can at least do some introductions. Um, so hello, I am Dr. Chloe Faraha. I am a white woman with a shaved head, giant glasses, wearing a kind of rose dress sitting in my office. Um, I'm an autistic academic and educator and trainer. Um, and today we are a group of autistic people uh, wanting to share our concerns about the recently announced uh, Spectrum 10K study. We are all aware that the study uh, team have released a statement that they are actually pausing data collection currently um, and we will address this as our concerns still stand. Um, before introducing the panel, on behalf of the wider Boycott Spectrum 10K team, I have a short co-produced statement to read. So the Boycott team is far more extensive than those who appear on the panel tonight. Just like the autistic community itself, we include a wide range of experiences, identities and intersectionalities. We recognise that those who can openly oppose the Spectrum 10K project are able to do so because, because of structural advantage. While it is essential that all are represented, it is also essential that we respect the wishes of and protect those of us who are part of the team and do not feel able or safe to speak out and keep their identities hidden. Should individuals wish to disclose their personal information and experiences, this is entirely their decision to do so. Um, and so just to be clear, we are such a small number that you can see on the screen compared to the actual much larger number who for the last three weeks, um, have been researching and putting together the statement, which I'm assuming many of you have now seen. Um, but we will be going through our concerns um, just to explain them and maybe add to them since we actually uh, 
published that statement, there's obviously been some updates, but they don't um, address our concerns. So I'm going to um, introduce people. Well, I say that they're going to do introduce themselves, but I'm going to ask people to introduce themselves um, with a brief sentence and just to give a brief visual description if they feel comfortable doing so. Um, so I'm just going in terms of the order that's on um, my screen here and not necessarily the order that's um, on the boxes on the screen. Um, so if I could just ask Monique, if you could uh, just introduce yourself and a brief description. Hi everyone. So I'm Dr. Monique Botha. I'm an autistic autism academic. Um, I also worked with autistic people and their families for a number of years as a social care practitioner. Um, and also importantly, I have um, intersections of other co-occurring disabilities that come with autism. So I'm a wheelchair user um, because of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, and a brief and I'm really passionate about um, advocacy on that. Um, in terms of a description of myself, I am white. I have long blondish hair. I'm wearing um, very thick black glasses. Um, and behind me is a bookcase type thing with a whole bunch of cooking books because I'm in the kitchen. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Holly Smale. Hi, um, so I'm a best-selling author of children's books, which um, feature a, an autistic uh, teenage girl. Um, and I was only recently diagnosed, so last year I was diagnosed, not really knowing that I'd written about autism for the last decade. Um, and yeah, that's, um, that's basically my background. <laughs> um, uh, visually, I am a blonde bob, um, red jacket, green painted wall behind me. Um, yeah, and oh, sorry, yeah, I'm a white woman. Thank you. And Ira? Um, hi, I'm Ira. I'm, uh, I use the pseudonym autistic science person on Twitter. Um, and I am an autistic self advocate. I'm an autistic person. And I'm a uh, PhD candidate in auditory neuroscience. And I do blogging and, you know, try to educate people on autism stuff. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, David Gray Hammond. Uh, I'm David. I'm an autistic mental health and addiction advocate. Um, I use the name Emergent Divergence on social media. Um, I am a white male of Mediterranean descent in my early 30s. I have shaved head and a beard and I'm wearing thick framed black glasses and behind me is my living room. Thank you. Uh, Pris uh, Priscilla Isles. Hi, my name is Priscilla Isles. I am a neurodivergent activist advocate. Um, can you can most often find me on Twitter under my name, Priscilla Isles. Um, I am also a project coordinator at Inclusion London, which is a disability um, people's organisation, and I do training around new diversions. Um, I am um, self-diagnosed autistic and ADHD. Uh, and to describe myself, I have short mix, um, short, uh, sorry, <laughs> short curly hair, um, mix, uh, mixed race, um, Zimbabwean English heritage, um, a turquoise top, gold gold rim glasses and I'm sitting in my living room. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Kieran Rose. Hi, um, I'm an autistic consultant, writer and researcher and um, I write at the autisticadvocate.com. I am a white man in my loft um, with my loft behind me. I'm wearing dark glasses, a plum t-shirt, and I have a shaved head, which is slightly balding. Thank you. And Tanya, Tanya Atkin. Hi, my name's uh, Tanya Atkin. I'm an autistic children and young persons advocate working in education, social care and health, um, as well as working directly with uh, families, etc. I am a white woman in her 30s with dark tied back hair, um, see-through glasses, and I'm sitting in front of a blue wall. Thank you. And Liz Soper? Hi, I'm Liz. I identify as she, her. Um, I am an autism ally and I work with a community group primarily uh, supporting children and 
parents are often unheard. I'm wearing um, mostly black and as a mixed biracial woman, I have curly hair and brown skin. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and we also have apologies from Emma Dalmain, who was hoping to join us today, but is unable to. Um, so that is our panel. We, like I say, are aware that we don't represent all of the autistic community, um, but I think it is fair that we do have a lot of concerns about this study that will potentially impact, um, you know, the vast majority of our community um, that we are very concerned about. Um, so first off, we thought, it, although I'm sure everyone must know by now what Spectrum 10K is, it would be a good idea to just have a brief, brief overview of what it is. Um, so Ira, if you wouldn't mind, would you be able to give us a brief overview of the study um, and then we can get into why we're concerned about it? Sure. Um, so Spectrum 10K is a study that um, started recruiting participants or advertising the study on August 24th of this year. Uh, basically, what I had uh, gotten from the website initially was that it was looking into the um, genes for autistic people or genes for autism, rather, um, and uh, co-occurring conditions to uh, improve the well-being of autistic people. So that is the general summary or like impression I got from the initial uh, recruitment advertising. And I think that's quite important what you said, which is that was the initial impression. And we're definitely going to talk about why that's actually a big concern, because um, the initial impression or how they publicised this study does not match with actually what they got funding for and a lot of um, other concerns in the background. Um, so thank you for that, Ira. Um, Tanya has just flagged for me that I also, for accessibility, I apologise, I forgot to say, you should, if you're on Facebook at least, be able to bring up captions. So if you've not used those before, so subtitles, there should be a little um, gear wheel um, on your screen somewhere and you should be able to click the captions. They won't be perfect, um, but they do improve after the recording um, is for the stream is finished and then it um, updates, I think, over time. Um, so. At first, what we're going to do is actually outline our key concerns very, very briefly, and then we're going to kind of cover them in a little bit more detail. Um, feel free, anybody in the comment section, to actually um, link where our 30 page statement uh, exists. Uh, there is plain summaries as well, so not just the um, the main document, and the main document does also contain those plain summaries for people um, to make it a little bit more accessible, but we are going to go through those very briefly. So our key concerns, even with the latest announcement that the study has paused, um, and I'm going to hand that over to Kieran, who's just going to outline what those are. Sure. Um, in no particular order, um, but it is the order we went through when we wrote the main document, um, we are concerned about the lack of transparency, uh, transparency around uh, the study and what they're telling the public and what they've received funding for. And um, we're concerned about the biodata regulations uh, where there's not clear information about what those are and how they're going to use them. There are consent issues, uh, which are one of the biggest things that we have concerns over about how the data has been used and how it's been obtained. Um, the suitability of the uh, principal investigators and the two main people and some of the others behind them. Um, that there are conflicts of interest riddled throughout this whole study, um, which aren't being disclosed. There are massive ethical issues about the study itself and also the ethical issues and the transparency um, given the disparities between what the study was awarded for and what they're actually telling the funding as well, which is similar to the last one, but there is a distinct difference between the two. Thank you. Um, and I think obviously you you heard all the descriptions of the, the types of people that we are here with our different backgrounds and our different roles. And so some of us, um, you know, a, a few of us have been looking at this from an academic perspective, um, but everybody has looked at this in terms of being critical, what, what is being asked. So please take that into account that we've looked at this from different perspectives and we were all very deeply concerned and that's why we all came together pretty much on the day this was released um, and for a number of us it was a shock release um, we weren't even aware that this was study was going to be happening um, although a small number were um, and pre pre kind of preparing for 
basically the issue of this study. Um, so in terms of, so, those, so Kieran's obviously explained um, briefly, those were our kind of key main concerns. So there's seven concerns there, but we're going to go through those in a little bit more detail. Um, so in terms of lack of transparency, for instance, so we feel that there is a disconnect between what the study is telling the public and what they actually received funding for. So a number of people, um, particularly Ira, has really, really delved into this and had a look and brought up um, what they actually were awarded um, funding for, and it seemed to be different to what they were telling the public, and so we're very concerned about that. Um, so I have a question as well. So um, as um, was just described about what this study is saying it's doing, or what it's proposing, or what it's telling the public, um, so this question kind of goes to that lack of transparency. So my question is um, for the panel, so lots of children have genetic testing already, so for instance Fragile X, so what's the difference with S10K, so Spectrum 10K, and why are we worried about this study then? Um, I feel potentially we had Monique who might want to address that. Hi, yeah, so Importantly, whenever you get a genetic test through um, for healthcare, so for example, as a child or as an adult, when you're going through being diagnosed with something like um, Fragile X or, for example, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, you also have access to, first of all, genetic counsellors, um, but it's individualised, right? So it's for receiving proper medical healthcare. Um, it's to make sure that you can receive individualized treatment um, and to make sure that you don't end up doing something that is counterintuitive to your health. So, for example, it took a while for me to be di diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And in the years beforehand, um, I did athletics. <laughs> Not ideal. Destroyed a whole bunch of my joints. Um, but I did undergo genetic testing specifically to find out whether I had um, a specific type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome because they usually test to make sure that people don't have vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome because of risk to life. Um, but that's completely different from taking part in a study that is looking at genetics because A, you will not get individualized information from this. It will not contribute to your healthcare. Um, but also it goes on to form a data set that then becomes publicly often um, available to a whole bunch of other research teams. Um, it can't provide you with the information that you need to make sure that you can access, for example, um, healthcare. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the, the difference is where that goes and who has access to that genetic information and what it's actually used for. And these are completely different things and they have different goals. Um, and the other thing is when you undergo that genetic testing, that information stays between you, the lab that is sent that data to test it, and your physician. Um, whereas this, not only will you not get to know the results of your individual genetic information, um, but it's becoming much more publicly available. Secondly, it can't actually address any of these things. So even though team members and on their Twitter, Spectrum 10K was saying, you know, we're doing this to help the autistic people who have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Well, great, but that's not necessarily the case. If that were the case, they'd be working very closely with researchers who have dedicated their lives to understanding Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or epilepsy or any of the co-occurring um, genetic conditions that we know about, except they're not. Um, and this is really key because, for example, people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and bear in mind, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair because of it, so I am very pro Ehlers-Danlos research funding, um, but this isn't contributing to understanding Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome um, because by nature it can't. The sample's not wide enough because you need non-autistic people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome to try locate the gene for hypermobility. Um, and it's the same with things like epilepsy. So even though they're saying that they're trying to address these genetic conditions which might impact quality of life for autistic people, they're not. They're trying to group autistic people by them, which by nature is very, very different and doesn't lead to changes in services, changes in treatment, changes in quality of life, because it doesn't actually address any of them. 
And I think a key thing that every all of us um, now know from looking at the different documents is they even state that you will not or your whoever's DNA you are handing over will never directly benefit from taking part in this study. I think that's also quite key. Um, why would you want to hand over DNA um, of your young person or yourself when the study is telling you you will not directly benefit um, from taking part. Does anyone want to contribute as well about this issue around lack of transparency? So what they are telling the public and what they are actually receiving the funding for. Is everyone being really polite? <laughs> um, oh, can I just jump in and just say from my perspective as a parent um, and coming back to hearing this news, um, it was such a shock and I think my biggest concern was those different aspects that what they were saying they were going to do was not transparent. And I think you have to start with a place of honesty. So for me, it was not only sounding like it would be traumatising to autistic people and to the community and probably cause some divide, but as a parent, it was like, wow, you're asking me to sign away my child's DNA? Um, for something not even being clear or honest about. So I think from, from a parent's perspective, it, it was really quite alarming. Thank you. David? I think this was sort of the point, though, wasn't it? Was if they had been transparent about what the research was actually for from the start, they would have had a much slower uptake because there would have been an immediate outcry from the autistic community, whereas it was a little perhaps a little slower because people had to take time to read what was going on and put the pieces together. Whereas, you know, which gave them time to, you know, they very quickly got like their first thousand participants, I seem to remember. Um, whereas I think if they'd have been transparent from the start, it, it would have been a much slower, well, it would have been a much quicker outcry against them. And Tanya? I think one of the key things for me is uh, why do they actually need children's DNA and people who cannot actually consent or comprehend what that actually means going forward? Surely if this was to benefit the autistic community and it was transparent and it was something that we, we would get behind it, we're not anti-science, we are science, a lot of us, we're massively overrepresented in science. Um, so I, I, I just, the obvious thing for me was that surely if this study was ethical and in our best interest, you would have 10,000 autistic adults that could give informed consent queuing up to do that, and they don't. Thank you. And somebody in the comment section, I mean, I'm doing it largely for people, um, but to just to make sure we're clear who's speaking. So I'm Chloe, I'm currently speaking. Um, so if I can ask Kieran, Kieran had your hand up. Um, I just think with the lack of transparency, it's not taken us much digging to expose an awful lot of stuff which has been clouded and kind of hidden. And and we can't. It, it sounds really conspiracy theorist to say it, but we can't help but think it's been done deliberately because it just looks like it has. Um, and, you know, the, the way that they've used celebrities as ambassadors and things, it's almost like they were trying to make it comfortable. They were trying to make it nice, trying to make it, you know, oh, look, there's these lovely people that we see talking about autism in a lovely way because we're parents and we believe these celebrities who are also parents. And it's like those people have been used as a kind of buffer between the reality of what the study is and what the study's projecting that it is. And it's just the whole thing just is so concerning to me. Thank you. Um, and then Priscilla. Yeah, um, the issue of sort of accessibility um, really is comes to the fore uh, in terms of the information they're providing. As people have said, it's very vague. Um, you know, what what do they mean by well-being? What do they mean by variability in, in outcomes? Does this take into in consideration racism does it take into consideration all of these intersectional concerns you know that's another 
whole thing you're going to. Um, but in just in terms of basic things that you would do to make it transparent and to make it accessible, especially if you're including children and, and you know, people who might be vulnerable, people who might, as autistic people, we know we can take things literally, we can we can see, take things at face value, we can trust in people and, and not read between the lines and not see, you know, how vague they're actually being sometimes. Um, you know, I've looked at their easy read guide for children and adults and it's it's just awful all it says is we're going to do a study about autism and um this is what research is we ask you questions um, and it's and then oh you know ask your parent or ask your clinician if you want to find out more or call the, the nhs number um to you know with concerns it's like well this is ridiculous how is this helping at all how are you any more informed <laughs> So yeah, it's 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 gravely concerning that like they think that's accessible and that's it's it's basically minimum requirement <laughs> to oh this looks okay we'll just put that out there. And and Monique, so there's also a lack of transparency between. So let me start again. I do research into some of like um, autism researchers' perspectives around conducting autism research. And one of the things that I, I tend to see is that people use flowery language, but don't explain. So they, for, for example, on the Twitter page, they said that, you know, they're doing this genetic research because of quality of life. Now, anyone might look at quality of life and say, well, we want autistic people to have better quality of life. Who wouldn't? But you see, when autism researchers say that, they tend to almost divide into two groups. One group thinks that quality of life is achieved through support acceptance and accessibility. The other group tend to think that quality of life is precluded by autism. So what that means is they don't think that autistic people by virtue of their autism have access to a good quality of life. So when they talk about quality of life, what they talk about is removing the autism. So even though at a higher level, both of these researchers are saying the same thing, you know, we want autistic people to have good quality of life. What's just below that is vastly different. And this is the really important thing. The last 20 years of research point to the fact that quality of life and mental health and well-being is affected exceptionally heavily by things like perceived acceptance, minority stress, intersectional minority stress across things like race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, Quality of life is a social product. It's not something that you can access by genes. And we've tried to do this with various minority groups and it hasn't worked because it is a social thing. People could have, for example, very similar genetics, grow up in completely different spaces and have access to completely different qualities of life depending on the situations that they face. And what we know from research is that autistic people are much more likely to, for example, be victimized, be excluded from school settings, be incarcerated. Um, they have, or they get exposed to discrimination, stigmatization, marginalization. Support services aren't designed for us. We don't have research, proper research into supporting good quality of life for autistic people. And that becomes even less when you put it with intersections. So for example, autism research has a race problem, a gender problem, a sexuality problem. Um, and all of those things are the things that are actually compounding on quality of life for autistic people. So when they say that they're using DNA specifically for quality of life, what they're not telling you is that they can't, that doesn't exist. And there's something else that they're pointing to there. Um, and the genetic determinism actually belongs to a, a long line of a eugenic tradition, which is itself based in like a racialization um, and racism itself that you, you can't use this information to get or to understand those outcomes. Um, and that's why every time someone has asked them, well, how will this help? They haven't been able to give an answer. They've just said, well, we can create subgroups. Um, and that's it. 
And for people who want to understand a bit more about why subtyping and subgroups is a problem and why it's already been removed from diagnostic processes, that is in a bit more detail in our statement. Um, I'm just conscious of um, moving on to other points too, so we could keep going on so many different tangents. Um, so the next person, I believe, is Holly, I think. Is that right? Yeah, um, I think my one of the big issues I had with the um, with, with the whole thing was that the language they were using was incredibly emotional. Um, and we know that within you know the community, we all sort of know some of us more than others. But, you know, the background of where this is coming from, the history of autism, you know, how we've been treated over hundreds of years and science behind it. Simon Baron Cohen, which we'll go on to a bit later, but like we know the history, but the, the general public, the people being appealed to, don't know that necessarily. And the emotional language was so heavy on it. It was almost like if you love your kids, then you'll give us this. You know, if you if you care about autism, if you care about autistic people, then you'll do the best thing, which is this. And it was so manipulative for me. I personally felt that the language they were using was basically saying, if you don't do this for us, then you don't care about your kids and your bad people, which is just it really, really gives me the crease because yeah, it's it's not it's not moral or ethical to do that. I don't think, especially with people who are looking to who love their children and who you know love their family members. And 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 I think coming back to Monique's point as well, which is who's dictating quality of life? We plenty yeah. of autistic people speaking, non-speaking, and so on do try to explain what our issues when it comes to quality of life are um, and so Robert in the um, comments is explaining um, you know is it the don dominant conception of well-being is it a neurotypical non-autistic understanding of well-being is it purely being autistic that is seen as a well-being issue or are they actually which we know they're not um, addressing the things that actually are, are problems for us um, as Monique outlined um, and Ira next please so just to step back and just just very at the very basic part of talking about consent right understanding what what's going on what where your data is going to go and all this stuff um the issue one of the fundamental issues i have had is the fact that we haven't gotten straight answers from the researchers themselves i haven't heard i sent an email specifying exactly my questions for clarification from the participant information sheet in the consent form that's on their website. And I asked, you know, very like yes or no questions. Like how is my data going, how is this data being used? How would it be stored? Would you, um, if I withdrew, what would happen? And I didn't get a response. Um, many autistic people who sent emails regarding clarification of the consent form didn't get a response. I asked, you know, what are, what do you mean by information? Because they use the words information, uh, samples, data in all very different places. So I don't know if they're talking about the same thing. So just fundamentally, this, I don't feel like as a graduate student in neuroscience, I would have the ability to un be, have informed consent to consent to the study because I don't even know what they're what my information would be in there and how I, whether I could access it and, and whether like I could really withdraw. I mean, they say you can withdraw, but it's, it's still not clear <laughs> even when you do line by line of the consent form. And so to me, that's just, that's just not like, that's just problematic. And to then advertise this to parents and have their children sign up as here's, here's the DNA of my six-year-old uh and and i'm sure they they can't understand exactly what's going on so it, it just there's so many issues <laughs> that need to be kind of resolved and and we haven't gotten a response i mean they haven't even reached out and and explained more they haven't updated their participation information sheet or um like any specifics i just there's no specifics here i just they've kind of been repeating the same this is for well-being and we're looking at subgroups so yeah and that detail must exist somewhere because there's no way you, you know, the, the small number of us that have actually put in for funding, etc. There's no way you would get funded with a really flowery, unspecific 
study, particularly when you're asking for something like people's DNA. Um, and I made a comment earlier today, which is, you know, I've put in ethics forms often. Um, I've never had to deal with anything as, um, you know, valuable, if you like, as people's DNA. But I've never in those ethics forms had to state quite clearly that I'm anti-eugenics. And so that I think is quite glaring to us that why do they keep going to that if they know it's, it's almost like they know where they're going with that they know the things that we're going to be concerned about um Monique yeah so just to make this really clear to people who don't know research when you create um participant information sheets and consent forms there's usually an extra box on there and this is really important because it says um that you have the option to consent for that data to be used in future studies now, in all of the research that I've ever done, <laughs> um, or all of the research that I've been involved with, that's always been um, optional in that you can choose that option or not choose that option and still participate. And then your data will only be used in one specific study and does not go on to form a data set. Now, what's really important is the difference between that being optional and mandatory. Um, and I think that there is a lack of transparency around the fact that actually in most research, it is optional and it's optional because it is technically, I think, unethical to ask people to consent to studies that they have no idea about, right? And there are systems that you could put in place theoretically to make sure that people can continue re-consenting for their use of data in future research. Um, and that is a very quite simple thing to set up that has not been set up. And I think it is because they know that even if autistic people decided to consent in this, the kind of studies that they want to or other people want to use this information for, um, the same people wouldn't necessarily consent. And that's why it appears to be mandatory. Um, and that distinction really matters. Thank you. OK, so moving on to um, onto our biodata regulations. So I say moving on, it's it, everything's obviously connected. So I have a question for the panel. So um, Simon Baron Cohen and S10K put out a statement about pausing the study following the concerns of autistic people. Why does this statement about pausing not allay our concerns? Um, did anyone in particular want to take a stab at that one? Um, so I was uh, going to mention that uh, essentially, um, so the other thing that they didn't mention before recruiting and starting advertising the study to people is that um, Simon Baron Cohen and Daniel Geshwind, and let me get my notes, who else? Uh, so Professor Simon Baron Cohen, Dr. Matthew Hurls, Professor Daniel Geshwind, and Professor David Rowich um, all were awarded this grant in 2018, and it's called the Common Variant Genetics of Autism and Autistic Traits Consortium. And the very first uh, uh, point in the summary of what they're trying to accomplish with this grant, and this was awarded in 2018, was to collect 10,000 samples of autistic people's DNA, essentially. Um, and I have to assume <laughs> that that number is the same as the Spectrum 10 case study. So they were awarded funding to essentially um, find or not find, but like, yeah, search for or correlate um, the genetic markers for autism. And that is what the project description of the grant actually states. It doesn't state anything about co-occurring conditions. So although they have paused the study, um, this award is specifically for looking at genes, for find, trying to find a genetic marker for autism or like subtyping autism. That's also listed as one of their, their goals in this, this grant. Um, and the other one is to combine this 10,000 samples with um, other data sets of autistic people to get up to 100,000 samples um, of a genetic database of autistic people's genes, essentially. So to basically what I've gathered from this is that Spectrum 10K is kind of like a, hey, we want to add data to all of this other data that we're going to use in future studies. However, they haven't disclosed this. 
Um, and so therefore, even though they pause the study, the actual funding is for genes. So I don't see how they could do the study without looking at genetic data or asking for genetic data because that is what the funding is for and was submitted for. And Monique, I think I got Monique and then Tanya, but I might be wrong. So please let me know if I missed somebody. Yeah, so mine's a really simple point and it's that meaningful consultation doesn't start halfway through. Um, and this is really important. Co-production means meeting with people right at the beginning, establishing common values, um, deciding, you know, what is a community priority, what would make a big difference, um, and building up the project together. And you build up the aims together, you build up the method together, um, you build up what you want the outcome to be. And then those people then go on to, for example, facilitate um, things like data collection, writing up, interpreting the data. Um, and it's because you can't, you can't drop people in and you'll get people who are like, I don't know, who might run into consulting midway through. Um, but the thing is, that's not when research establishes its goals or its aims or its values. That's right at the beginning. So even pausing the study now, it's not going to make that much of a difference because they've already made the participant information sheets. They've made the consent form. They've decided on the aims. Um, the only thing that autistic people can do now when they go into consult is tell them exactly what the concerns are. But we're doing that anyway. Um, if they really wanted to build up something that was co-produced with autistic people, that would have been in 2017 before the grant went in in 2018. That, that train is gone. That has left the station. Um, so pausing isn't really enough. It needs to stop. And if they want to do something that's going to contribute to quality of life and autism um, or for autistic people, then actually they need to partner right at the beginning. I think Tanya and then Kieran, is that right? Yeah, just a really quick point as well that I wanted to make about where they're going to be combining this data and sending it to, because it's not going to stay within the UK. It's going to go straight over to America to where um, Daniel Gershwind, Gershwind, I can never say that word, is, is located. So are we protected with the same laws? And how do you really ever anonymize it when it's medical records and genetic data? Is it really, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but my understanding is, and somebody can correct me if, they're, if I'm wrong, my understanding is, you know, genetic data is individual to the person. So how can that actually ever really be fully anonymized? Yeah, really key point. Yeah, DNA literally tells you who an individual is. So how can it ever be completely and fully anonymized? Uh, and Kieran? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, I know we're going to be getting into... Um, Professor Baron Cohen and uh, Daniel Geschwinden a bit later, but there's an assumption here that if it's paused, that they're going to rethink what they're doing and there's some kind of reformation available for this study, but you know, that they can change it and it's going to be acceptable and it's going to be okay. But without going too deeply in it, because we're going to talk about them in a bit, but the two people that are at the head of this, they're not going to change their way of thinking they're, 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 they've been thinking this way for a very very long time they've been doing the things and building up to this moment for a very very long time they're not suddenly going to stop and turn around and say hold on a minute we're really really wrong we're going to change everything that we're doing about this study because we agree that it's wrong secondly they can't do that because that's what they've been funded for and that would involve having to give back the money um, which Simon Baron Cohen has never walked back from walked back anything that he's ever said. He's not retracted anything that he's ever said over the course of his career. He's not going to suddenly start doing that now. And then the third point of that is that even if they did manage somehow to change the study, if they stopped, if they stopped it being about DNA collection, um, or they changed the way that they were going to use the DNA, or made assurances that the DNA was not going to be passed onwards, surely there's consent changes there as well. So they would have to get consent from everybody they've already got consent from again. The whole thing would literally have to stop and restart again right from scratch. And that's going to cost a fortune. A huge amount of their funding will have already gone into the advertising, the promotion and all of that. And to start from scratch again, pausing this, I think, is performative. It's a way of rebranding. It's a way of softening the blow. And it's a way of saying, 
let's sit on this for a little bit. It'll all go quiet. They'll get bored. They'll forget about it and we can move on and we can carry on doing what we're doing. I fundamentally believe that that is the reason for this pause. And was there somebody else who wanted to add to that? Priscilla, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, just to add to the bit about co-production, because I have been researching this a lot for my job. Um, I mean, OK, so if they were really doing co-production, my feeling is this project would have never been done in the first place, because one of the first things you'd find out is what are the autistic communities people's needs? And I mean, this is probably there's a lot of information about this already, but you would at least try to figure out what is the most pressing need? um what is going what are the thing? what are your ideas that is is important to you and not just this is what we're going to do um can you come in and be the face of this and you know just go along with it because we've already decided what we're actually going to do and what the funding is for and everything else so it's it, in no sense is it co-production in any way it's sort of this kind of government like idea of co-production like the you know like job seekers allowance idea of what the social model is or something you know like dwps that's what it brings to mind is this pandering to this idea that we're using autistic people in the process but actually when you look at it how many autistic people are there and then they talk about researchers not, not wanting to disclose and all of this stuff so i mean there's just in no way is it co-production at all and I just think there's so much that needs to be done at the very start, but to even figure out what it is you want to concentrate that research on that's going to most benefit people. So, yeah. And it certainly does feel like basically non-autistic researchers deciding what they are interested in doing in what yeah. they craft. This is my ex expertise and this is what I want to focus on. And regardless of whether there's any benefits, it's proven already that how is this going to benefit us? It, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> and completely ignoring a number of papers and co-produced pieces of literature that actually explain uh, the key uh, study aims and research aims of the autistic community. And, and this is really not high on, mm -hmm. if at all, no. on those study aims. Um, I believe Ira is next. Um, yeah, so the other thing that I uh, would like to bring up is, and something they didn't tell the public also, was that they previously have asked uh, autistic people if they'd like to be ambassadors to the study before it was even public. And they gave information. And yes, I know Kirin wants to talk about that. Um, but they literally got feedback from people who um, they asked to be ambassadors and the autistic people said no. They said no. And they some, some, many of them gave reasons. Uh, and, and so they had, they got feedback, right? And they, and they didn't do anything they didn't do anything until they were publicly called out on it. And so to me, that just rings true. What Kirian was saying is like, and also in their statement, in their newest statement, it says something about the study will resume once consultation is complete or something, as if that's enough, right? Once the consultation's done, regardless of whether we really do anything or not, we're going to start the study again. <laughs> so that's what I got from that statement. Which, again, makes no sense because particularly, um, you know, um, I, I know somebody said that um, Simon Baron Cohen at somewhere in amongst all the things that we've looked at for the last three weeks, which means I've forgotten where everything comes from anymore, um, stating that in consultation, should people not want DNA, then they would stop collecting DNA. And that's just it's really not possible. You, that would be a completely different study. And they, that would that wouldn't even be a major revision of the study. They would have to scrap it and start again for new funding. Um, Kieran. Yeah, just to add to what Ira said, I was one of those people. Um, I was invited uh, about six months ago to be an ambassador for the study. I was given a uh, media information pack, which told me not much at all. It was just, <laughs> it was a lot of National Autistic Society points about how many autistic people there are in the UK and, and the usual blather that you get. Um, there was nothing more than that in it. And um, there was a little bit of an explanation about the study and how wonderful it was going to be and very vague again, you know, nothing more really than we know now. Um, and I replied to them and I said, no, thank you very much. Um, and explain why very clearly and received tumbleweeds. No, nothing back from them whatsoever. And that was it. Um, it was supposed to be launched in February. I do. I dug the email out this morning. Um, it was supposed to happen in February, so I don't know if COVID has played some part in delaying what's been going on with them. Um, but their um, their ambassadors and their consultation group 
that they initially had. Um, it cl very clearly states in their literature um, that they meet once a year. That's it. Once a year. That, that's not consultation. That's that's not even, you know, we've been talking about co-production and participatory. That's nothing. That's a cup of tea and a biscuit, you know, for 10 minutes just to say, this is what we're doing. And everybody's go, yeah, that sounds great. And that's it. There's no, there's, there's no nothing there further than that. And I think it's just, and when you look at the list on their website of who is in their consultation group, it very clearly does say autistic people, but then it's parents, it's charity representatives, and then it's people from the medical industry. So, you know, so and when we just, when we say charity representatives, we know who those charities are going to be, who are they going to be representing. It's the same people talking about the same things. And Simon Baron Cohen has a golden ticket to get away with what he wants. And that's part of the problem, I think which we will come on to. Um, yes. So David and then Monique, and then we can start moving on to the next next section. So, I think to add to Kieran's point, um, the inclusion of autistic people in this consultation was completely performative. It was just a, it was just a means of trying to say, well, look, you know, we, we asked you and uh, you were okay with it. It's like, well, no, we weren't because you didn't ask us. You had one meeting once a year with, you know, a handful of autistic people when we are a wide and diverse community. Um, and, you know, like I said, quite frankly, it, it's completely performative. And I think it's the same with this statement. They're saying they want to go away and have meaningful consultation. It's just another performance to, to pacify. And Monique? So again, just to highlight how this could be done and Recently, I applied for a grant with some colleagues um, and we wanted to interview autistic people about shifts in um, identity from pre-diagnosis over a two year point while they were undergoing um, the diagnostic process using photos and a whole bunch of things. And we were going to work with autistic people on this. And it was a small enough grant. I think it was about £20,000. The vast majority of that £20,000 was going on co-production, right? Um, we budgeted talking and meeting and building this project with autistic people and we were going to meet them, um, I think it was every two weeks sort of thing. Um, so this is, this is telling you um, what co-production looks like. If someone says that they're gonna meet with autistic people once a year, research moves so quickly that 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 means nothing decisions are made day in day out and if you are involving people in the decision process then that means that you need to meet i would i would argue at minimum once a month um which means 12 times a year um otherwise you are making decisions without consulting autistic people and I'm, I'm similar. I've, I've actually sat in as that autistic um, person on like steering groups and things. So a couple of projects that I've been on, like say, lots of money was put aside specifically to do true co-production. Co so there was a, an all autistic steering group. Um, there are autistic academics on the advisory board. So like the academic advisory board, there are autistic practitioners it was very, very autistic um, driven at all levels and in a non tokenistic way. I think that's that's the issue as well, that people particularly like this, this particular study will say, well, we've consulted with autistic people. Well, what autistic people? Um, some of us aren't always knowledgeable about the community issues, you know, um, so it's a bit problematic because sometimes it is very tokenistic. OK, so in terms of we're still only on to point two, um, but that is it's all kind of it all feeds into each other. So the key point for point two for us is the biodata regulation. So we've obviously covered this to some extent. So in terms of what we've stated as a concern specifically on our um, statement, we expect to see clear information about what the regulations about around biodata are, its use and future use once the main study is completed. So as has been mentioned, our concern is that you cannot participate without consenting, which means it's not really consent if you feel you either can or cannot take part. You can't take part basically if you don't consent to your data being used in the future by other bodies that this particular study 
feels are the right people to send the data to. Um, so yeah, we're concerned about that future use once the main study is completed and further, why could the use of DNA data by others not have been an optional consent clause? Um, so that was the, the point too. And I believe we've covered this, Ira, the, the, the consortium. So I feel like we've covered that point. Good, okay, thank you. Um, obviously we've mentioned it multiple times, but this is just because of the structure and I do like structure. Um, consent issues. So with the lack of transparency and clarity about what the study is, what it will do and how it will do it, and um, what it will do with the genetic data, there's no potential participant basically can provide sufficiently informed consent because of how vague um, and poor the information is, you, you really cannot give informed consent um, and that's something as a researcher again Monique will be aware of this um, Ira will be aware of this is you have to be giving as much information as possible so that that person does really understand what they are consenting to otherwise it's not informed consent um, so I think we've discussed that I'm just checking that we haven't or not missed any points have I missed hand I'm sorry did I miss somebody no nope, just double checking um, so lots to manage here. Um, so I believe we've covered that. So we've covered um, omitting the information about the consortium, the plans to combine the data set. So I think we've covered all that. Can I just check in case anybody wanted to add anything? Monique? I just wanted to really highlight a point that was made earlier, and that's even if they tell you that a consent form or a participant information sheet needs to contain jargon it doesn't there are ways of making it accessible transparent and informative and in psychology or psychological based research usually people are worried about things called um almost like biasing so they're worried that if they give you enough information um that you might change your answers However, the primary use of this data does not actually involve hypotheses testing. Instead, they're looking at commonalities between genes. So there is nothing, and I mean nothing, in that um, that they can bias your answer to, right? Because that exists um, as a sample, which means that they have no excuse for not being very, very transparent, very, very open, um, and providing you with an opportunity to give informed consent. That is a choice that they have made, um, and there are other choices that could be made there. Thank you, Monique. Yeah, uh, and again, I'm, I'm so aware of that. And, and even I feel that that argument for many researchers, it really, in this day and age, it doesn't really hold water. I don't think it is fair to keep going back to this whole thing. Well, if we tell them enough information, they'll know what I'm trying to do in this study. Well, we, we still, I think we need to be doing that more um, to actually have more realistic um, expectations and give better information for people to be able to consent to. Um, so carrying on with our um, point about consent issues, obviously about collecting DNA. Um, and I think this is for all of us here, we've had this discussion. Um, the next point that Holly's going to make is really our main concern about this study. Um, even putting aside issues that we will all have about the possibility of eugenics, uh, I think this point is, is much um, more important. Holly. Yeah, so we've talked about obviously how the study is saying that um, the DNA can be essentially um, shared once the study is over and there's no kind of limitation to that put in. And the main concern is that with children and vulnerable adults, um, they apparently are going to be, well, they already have their DNA connected, collected. And that information um, has been handed over without their consent by parents and carers um, forever. So that that basically that DNA can be held um, like on this on a system and studied. It's lifelong commitment. Children basically have no control over whatsoever. Um, and as children, they can't they can't understand what that's going to mean and how they're going to feel in the future and whether their views are going to change or, or you know. Um, so the implications of that data being used in the future is like the main concern I think that everybody's got um, shouldn't be shouldn't be happening. Um, and yeah, so anyone want to add to that? Oh, hold on, I missed a few hands. So I think 
I don't know who was first. I'm going to go with David and then I'm going to go with Kieran. If, if somebody else had their hand up, can you just pop it in the chat box for me? So if I could focus on the children in particular here, you know, um, as we said, you know, children are going to grow up and maybe or maybe not become aware of the fact that their DNA was part of this study. Now, when I look at this, you know, Simon Baron Cohen was himself quoted as saying that they can't guarantee that someone in the future won't use this for eugenics. Now, imagine you grow up, you become a proud member of the autistic community like many of us have, and then you find out that your DNA is contributing to the destruction of that community and you did not consent to that. That is a traumatic realization to have. And, you know, I say this very aware of the fact that autistic people are already so prone to trauma in their lives anyway. You know, do we really, you know, I, something I'd like parents to consider is do you really want to risk adding to that that potential trauma that your child could go through by having them one day realize that they have had their DNA contributed to something to stop people like them existing. And I just want to double check. So Kieran, did you want to go next? Yeah, just to kind of add to that, there is a, um, a disclaimer that children can withdraw once they reach the age of 18. Um, if parents have handed the, the, the consent over on their behalf and, um, but then there's the issue again of once that DNA has been passed on to these wonderful unspecified organizations that um, Professor Baron Cohen insists are going to be fully ethical and um, wonderful and use it completely ethically. Um, once we have GDPR laws in the UK, which can could be used to protect people's data, um, we're not quite sure how that applies to DNA and how much that has sway that has over DNA. But once that DNA has left the country, and a child says, I wish to withdraw from this study, but that DNA has then been passed on to two, three, five, 10, 15, 30 other studies outside of the UK where that child has no access to withdrawing that. Where's the consent? There is no consent there. Once it's gone, it's gone. And they have no control over that whatsoever. I mean, we have, we have debates constantly about whether to put pictures and videos of children on Facebook. Why would you hand their light, their whole genome over to complete strangers to do with whatever they may wish at some unspecified time in the future? It's ridiculous. And Priscilla. Yeah, I just have huge concerns about, so the people involved in this research, like Simon Baron Cohen, and what, you know, the subgrouping that he says could be a benefit of this research. It just has so many racist implications, so many misogynistic implications. He talks about the talent of autism being about maths, of, of this idea of, you know, the white rain man, uh, and that's autism. Um, you know, and this is there's a whole reason why I find it so hard to be recognized as an autistic person, why I find it so hard to be diagnosed, which is what I'd really love research to be done on, <laughs> you know, is how can we actually improve diagnosis services so they're more intersectional. Um, but, you know, instead we have people leading this who think that, you know, like the the special talent of of <laughs> being autistic is numerical ability. And I, you know, what are they going to do with that information? As I've heard beforehand, that they're going to be collecting information from black and Hispanic people in America. Um, and if they are going to be using it to screen in the future, you know, what is what is identified as high functioning and low functioning and with all the presumptions that we make about black people and behavioral issues anyway. Um, and so that is extremely worrying for me and, and has so much historical precedent in the use of um, taking medical information from black people without consent as well. So yeah, there's a lot of implications there really, it's just very worrying. Thank you. Did anyone want to add? That's an incredibly poignant point. So, I mean, our next uh, section, if you like, is the suitability of the principal and co-investigators, which I think a number of you have touched on now as well, which I think, Priscilla, you, you've kind of touched on this too. So based on their track records, we seriously call into question the suitability of the principal and co-investigators. That's a huge ethical concern um, that actually 
ethics boards take seriously or they should be taking seriously um, usually when they're looking at funding studies for instance um, you know you think about who are the investigators um, so we're just going to play a short um, clip of um, Simon Baron Cohen been interviewed I think recently can anyone correct me if that it was August 24th yeah right when the study came out August 24th and then Geshwin and th that was also recently that was June 25th 2021 yeah but still this year so these are um principal and co-investigators of this particular study so let me just deal with the tech In terms of your, your other question about cure, mm -hmm. um, we're not trying to cure autism itself. You know, autism is part of the person. So in terms of the causes, it's really, as we know, it's crucial to know the cause of a disease to treat it most effectively. Um, autism has a biomedical origin. In terms of your, your other question about cure, mm -hmm. um, we're not trying to cure autism itself. You know, autism is part of the person. So in terms of the causes, it's really, as we know, it's crucial to know the cause of a disease to treat it most effectively. Um, autism has a biomedical origin. In terms of your... Thank you. I think people could hear me. Um, so it did play round twice. So hopefully people heard it. Um, anyone want to comment on why we've shown that particular little snippet and that, that video? Uh, David, and then I know we've got Kieran and Ira also talking about our issues with the suitability of these two um, investigators. So, David? Well, I think on your point about why did we show this clip, it demonstrates perfectly the inconsistencies in what the public are being told and what the people behind the study actually want. I mean, especially when you look at Daniel Geshwind, you know, his associations with certain organisations, which I'm sure someone will go into in more detail um you know it's very clear what he wants and it's it's a it's it's to cure autism um you know and and i think that's been hidden as best as they can although it didn't take an awful lot of searching to find that connection there thank you um and so kieran do you want to first talk about i guess our issues with simon baron cohen <laughs> how long do we have? Yeah, we don't have that long. We, we do how do I succinctly people... compress the last 40 years? <laughs> we do direct people to Kieran's um, article that was written today. Um, so if anyone in the comment section wouldn't mind linking that, that'd be great. Thank you, Kieran. Yeah. Um, uh, I wrote that in the early hours of this morning, so please forgive any spelling mistakes. Um, I've done, I did it. The reason that I wrote it, I haven't written anything about Spectrum 10K up until now, apart from a really short statement right back at the very beginning. And the reason for that is that I didn't have an in with it because so many people had written such good stuff. And then I realized what my hook was, and it's been my bugbear for the last 20 years of my life, and it is Simon Baron Cohen. Um, he has dominated the autism narrative for the past 25, 35 years, um, right back to the kind of mid 80s through to the mid 90s when he was working on theory of mind with Uta Thrift, um, when he was working and then developed his extreme male brain theories from there, all of which have been critiqued heavily and debunked heavily. You know, with the, the modern understanding of what autism is and how autistic people think and feel and all of those kind of things has completely wiped the floor with those theories. Um, but Simon Baron Cohen remains someone who makes a profit off of those theories, a huge profit off of those theories, and remains the person that's wheeled out as a consultant for charities, for organizations, for research bodies, sits on the editorial boards of loads of uh, uh, research journals. He is still sitting at the top of the tree when it comes to autism research. The issue is with things like theory of mind is that Simon has blood on his hands, to put it bluntly. There, there's no other way of putting it. His theories have contributed to the reasons that you as parents, particularly those of you that have um, children who are assigned female at birth, um, 
went undiagnosed have mental health problems and um, when you go to cams and sips and ask for help for your children because they have mental health problems simon is the reason that those those that help doesn't exist that's why you're turned away because of things like extreme male brain because of things like um lack of empathy and theory of mind those really really problematic narratives that he is invested in now over time he's kind of slightly drifted away from talking about those things and has moved on to pattern spotting and and things like that and that really reinforces what priscilla was saying just before around how he has such an investment in autistic people that he deems valuable he deems able to contribute to society this ableist society that we live in the only people the autistic people that he deems value are the ones who are able to contribute the mathematicians the scientists the ones who have what he sees as intelligence people who don't speak, people that he would see as low functioning or severe, those people with different co-occurring conditions that contribute to their presentation of existence, they're easily discarded, which is where we come on to um, things like this, things like, uh, sorry, things like spectrum. I'm actually really nervous tonight. I'm not normally nervous, but this is, I'm so wound up. This is like three weeks of angst coming out here. Um, so when we have something like Spectrum, which he is at the heart of and he's at the lead of, and he's paired up with someone like Daniel Geshwind, who um, Ira is going to take us through in a minute, the narratives that come out of this are blatantly obvious to me of where he wants to take this and what he wants out of it. What he wants ultimately is to keep and save, if we're going to use a, a, an Asperger's kind of um, notion and, and, and uh, uh, comparison here, people talk about Asperger's as you know, saving the people who he felt were valuable and discarding those who weren't. That's a narrative that people talk about around Asperger. This is exactly the same narrative here. Baron Cohen identifies people that he sees as valuable and wants to get rid of people who he sees as not valuable. And that's a very impassioned way of saying it, but there is a huge amount of mistrust between advocates, particularly amongst the autistic community who are aware of the history of autism and where this comes from and where it's going to lead and Simon Baron Cohen. Now, the only way that this could be reformed to my mind was if Baron Cohen and Geshevind weren't a part of it. Then maybe we could talk. But from where I'm standing, Simon Baron Cohen, like I said earlier, has never retracted or walked back any of his theories, no matter how much harm that there has been from his theories and no matter how much his theories are embedded in services. So uh, it's I'm waffling now because I'm angry. This is his like uh, this is this is so got me so hot up that he is still here dominating the narrative. He dominates researchers. People are afraid to call him out. I know that in academia that happens because they're afraid of being blacklisted because of the amount of power he wields over different fields and different areas. He's there at the seat of government. He's there with na the National Autistic Society as a vice president. He's a consultant to Ambitious About Autism. He sits on the AIMS EU2, uh, the EU AIMS2 project. He sits on Autism Europe. He sits on every major body that dominates the autism narrative. And he's right there at the top of the tree. And it's just such a huge ethical conflict for me that he is not suitable to be doing this kind of research. I fundamentally believe that. Thank you. And, and hopefully somebody's linked the article that you wrote because you also detail quite a lot of that. And I think coming back to, so I'm going to go to Tanya and then Monique, um, but coming back to your point as well, um, Kieran, which was about that you're nervous and you're stressed. And I think actually... I, I hope everyone here who is watching us, um, whether you're watching it live or afterwards, um, we are exhausted. We are not OK um, as autistic people. This has really, really taken a lot out of so many of us. Like I say, we are really just the tip of the iceberg that you can see on the screen. There's been so many people behind the scenes and we have been supporting each other, crying with each other um all sorts of things this is this is not okay um we are not just annoying autistic people who just don't like the idea of this study okay we are not okay about this um so can i go to tanya please hi yeah i just wanted to make a really a really quick point um about simon baron cohen because obviously i work with um, an awful lot of autistic people and children and people experiencing crisis and um, it really puzzled me and because I'm not an academic I didn't actually understand so I asked the question 
why has this man got so much power in autism research? And I think that Kieran just kind of hit the nail on the head because even though we have got other good solid autism research i mean we've got damian milton we've got the theory of monotropism all that stuff and um, we've got kieran's masking stuff that he's just done with amy we've got all that stuff so why is this man still at the top when i think it is part of the um you know his his theories are so outdated but it's because of the power that he has over the whole subject of autism that nobody can really go against him and I kind of I can remember sitting with David the other day we wrote an article what else is is that he's really hell bent on pushing this subtype in theory which with all the the recent autistic led research is, that's come through has been completely scrapped and if you are an autistic person or know autistic people you will know that you can't put us into groups we are all individuals but it also see, it seems to me like he's almost trying to be a modern day Hans Asperger, where he's essentially sorting autistics out between useful and not useful. And, you know, he's championing the mathematicians and the little geniuses. But what's going to happen to the ones that he deems low functioning and not useful? It's do we learn nothing from history? Sorry, ran over. <laughs> no, um, uh, that's that's kind of also why we're here as well. Like I say, we're trying to get this all out. I'm going to go to Monique next. I just want to make a really important quick comment as well that somebody um, in our comment section, you know, that they're exhausted too and not okay and that they've been working hard to sign the little autistic people. There are no little autistic people. Um, whatever it is you are doing, we know you're not okay as well. I guess when I said that, it wasn't necessarily directed at those of us in whatever capacity you have been affected by the release of this study. We're talking more about people, the non-autistic researchers and things. We're saying as a community following the release of this study, um, we are not okay. So I do, I do want to acknowledge all the autistic people who've really been affected by the release of this study. Um, and Monique. So I'm gonna make a couple of points and they're informed by both my professional work and my personal life. So the first one is that, first of all, I was deemed one of the autistic people who wasn't going to make it. So I had what was essentially a mental breakdown around about the time that I was 13 um, and went through the most horrific and traumatizing psychiatric services. Um, and by the time I had a diagnosis, the psychologist point blank said to me, well, you'll probably die by suicide anyway. And it was horrific and traumatizing, but it added to the list of people who had written me off anyway, including teachers who found that I was too easily distracted, couldn't focus, couldn't do X, couldn't do Y, couldn't do Z, who pointed out all of my flaws, who said, and bear in mind, when they talk about autistic people who are non-speaking, that, that is in and of itself a spectrum. So I am situationally mute, but no one ever really necessarily sees that. Um, or round about the time that I lose my words um it's not necessarily apparent um to a lot of people and this is the problem with subtypings people look at me now and they're like well you have a phd you are married you have friends you live in your own like rented accommodation and you can make meals for yourself and i'm like first of all I consider autism to be a disability um, that has not changed. That is including when I have access to words and when I don't. When I was younger, I was written off and people didn't even think that I would make it into my 20s. If I were subtyped as a child, I would not be subtyped as the autistic person that I would be subtyped as today but even the image of who I am today is not a well-rounded image because I am selective around what people see 
And the reason that I'm selective around what people see is because there is an expectation that I have to live up to um, in order to be taken seriously professionally. So people see me and they're like, yeah, but you're just quirky, except I can't drive. I have very limited independence. I struggle with executive functioning around things like cleaning and tidying. Um, when I get wrapped up in things, it can take a while for me to go do things like eat or shower or bath. I am a very disabled person, but I also wouldn't change being autistic. Um, but from one day to the next, I would belong in a different category according to the very moment that you saw me. When people decide categories, they only have access to a sliver. They, they have access to 45 minutes or an hour, maybe over three appointments if you're lucky. And that is when they are deciding what category you're based on. And research shows that this is not reliable in that different researchers put different people into different categories on different days of the week because functioning or the idea of functioning is itself normative, unreliable, and variable, right? Which is one of the reasons that subcategories were removed to a certain degree from the DSM, right? Now, theory of mind as the basis for subcategories, God forbid, one of the problems with that, and now this is what, this is my speciality, a lot of the dehumanization that is still present in autism research specifically comes from that idea of theory of mind, because it fed the idea that we lack empathy, right? That we cannot understand the thoughts and emotions of other people. Um, when in actuality, anyone who has interacted with another autistic person would know that categorically, that is not true. Um, that That is just a thing, it's not true. Um, and yet it still feeds the popular narrative. Um, and that is prevalent in a lot of research and people don't call it out because actually you get either blacklisted or for example, and now this wasn't Simon Baron Cohen, However, in one of my papers, I went through dehumanizing research, um, called out a paper that was very explicitly dehumanizing, as in it meets every definition of dehumanization. Um, and I got a very abusive, scary email from a senior researcher telling me that I was slandering. I just couldn't possibly understand that genius. Um, and essentially threatening me that I should take the citation out. Um, and now me being me and the lack of self-preservation, I just changed it to a quote and interpretation of that quote, because that's like, well, you can't say it's slander if it's literally what you wrote. Um, but that is the kind of thing that happens that people don't really talk about. Um, as soon as you challenge the status Quo, um, and that is a very dehumanizing, dehumanizing thing to base categories off. Thank you. I don't know what happened to my internet, um, and I'm plugged directly in, which is really frustrating. Um, Priscilla, I think if you've got a comment next. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add to that a bit because. Um, the amount of times I've been told I don't look autistic, um, you don't seem autistic, you seem high functioning. <laughs> Every time I mention it almost, I think, um, is quite, it, it's frustrating. Um, it, it feels like if this is the general perception, um, you know, no wonder why my experience in the medical community be, has been one of just being completely dismissed. Um, <laughs> And, you know, my experience of trying to get assessed um, for ADHD and there being a little bit about 
ASD in it was that the the psychiatric nurse was completely leading the questions and had already assumed that I wasn't autistic and was saying stuff like oh you don't whore do you and it's just stuff like this that are led by this sort of thinking that Simon Baron Cohen promotes that there's only one sort of you know autistic person that is valid and then you know there's another type which we is not productive to society um it is just so damaging and i i have really struggled all my life um with i'm trying to understand myself and even just coming to terms with the fact that i had adhd and then to discover oh there's probably you know i most likely autism there as well but it was never going to be picked up unless actually my partner pointed it out to me even i had these fixed ideas of what autism was so even me who had done so much research around adhd and considered himself an advocate even i had kind of it had these ideas embedded into me and in what autism was so if even me can get these ideas you know it's just we yeah it is just so damaging and this is why i just feel like to spend three million on this genetic research when there's so much that could be done around understanding what autism actually looks like, how you know culture plays in, how if you have white parents, then you're more they're more likely to actually get a diagnosis for their children if you have black parents. All this stuff is is research that is so needed, and it's so frustrating to see three three million pounds spent on this. What that what, what's it going to do for my life? Nothing. It's not. What's it going to do for other people who are suffering right now? Don't even realise they have ADHD or autism, and are, are getting re expelled from schools and going into the prison system. So it, it is. These are real life consequences of wasting money on these kind of things. So. Yeah, <laughs> a bit of a run, but thank you. And somebody was just done a little shocked, surprised face as well at the three million. Is that how? Is that the cost? Um, yeah, and um, we've said multiple times, give us that three million and see what we can do with it. But that's that's um, towards later in our structure for today's discussion. Um, so next, uh, Kieran. I've calmed down now. <laughs> um, just kind of two points. Um, building on Priscilla's and Monique's really. Um, firstly, <laughs> we know that the diagnostic criteria is really weak, flawed in a lot of ways, and also intangible because it's something that changes. They update it, they add things, they take things away. They, it's a movable feast. So how then do you correlate that with genetics? How do you know what you're seeing is actually what you're seeing? Because you're relating it to a, a behavioral criteria, which is flawed, doesn't work very well, and is only relatable really to kind of people who are really quite traumatized and in, and, and in kind of crisis mode. So those two things firstly don't marry for me. So that's, that's a real kind of thing. And then you also have to have unidentified autistic people in the mix as well, because we know they're going to be looking for um, DNA from family members and things as well. So if they are looking for DNA from family members who identify as not autistic, the whole thing just is farcical, absolutely farcical, because you've got no control group there at all, because your control group could be completely full of autistic people as well. And you're comparing like against like, and just the whole thing falls to pieces. The second part there, which is kind of unrelated to that, but really what Monique was saying about kind of dehumanizing rhetoric. A couple of years ago, I wrote, wrote an article with um, Dr. Sophie Vivian about exactly this. She was doing a, a neuroscience course at King's College, and they literally had a debate about how to define a human being. And the, the definition they came up with was empathy. So therefore, the discussion went on to who do we exclude from that conversation? So it was people with dementia. It was autistic people. It was neurodivergent people generally, whether that's acquired neurodivergency or, or just general born neurodivergence. If these conversations are going on in university courses with new people coming into fields of neuroscience, psychology. We know that many universities talk about behavioral therapies, things like ABA and stuff like that in a non-critical way that, you know, these things are useful and we should be using them. If all this is going on in the background, all this dehumanizing rhetoric, all built and framed around ideas like Baron Cohen's around theory of mind that make us less human. We know Ivor Lovas said that in the 60s, you know, that, that, that we are incomplete humans that need to be filled up with humanity. I'm paraphrasing there, but these ideas are not new. 
this is eugenics. This is what this and this has been going on since the early early twentieth century and before. It's utterly ableist, utterly framed around racism and what Priscilla was saying about the intersectionality of all those different things, which are never taken into account. And everything assumes that autistic people exist in a vacuum, that we are not social creatures surrounded by things that impact us in society around us, that all of our problems are centered within ourselves. And, uh, you know, we've, we've probably wandered a bit off topic of terms of Baron Cohen and the issues with him. We haven't even gotten to Geshwind yet. But all his theories are framed and built around that fact that we are in a vacuum. We exist in a vacuum and our problems are here within us. And that we have that no matter what goes on around us, it doesn't matter because we're not fully human beings. I mean, he's quoted as saying that in the late 90s, that we are incomplete. We're not fully human because we lack theory of mind. It's just, he should not be involved in research at all. I wish they would just push him away. Retire, please, Simon. Please, Simon. Thank you. Um, and then Holly. Yeah, um, I think I think the kind of comorbidities and, and that kind of issue, it, it was it was a bit, yeah, I mean, first of all, confusing, because if that was what they were focusing on, then why weren't they just focusing on those and using neurotypical people with those conditions on as well, which kind of made sense. But there's also this also assumption that, that these comorbidities and things that we might struggle with, for instance, you know, I have quite I have quite a lot of them. I have celiac disease, I have a lot of gut issues, um, you know, things that cause pain and a lot of different things. They seem to assume that if you have struggle or pain, it means your life is less valuable in some way, or that you shouldn't be here, you have less of a right to be here, or that, you know, that we that we somehow don't want to be alive or we wish that we hadn't been born. And yeah. I think that that's just such a so it, it's not true for almost I'd say almost all of us I mean I, I very much want to be here regardless of the difficulty and a lot of that difficulty frankly comes from neurotypicals treating us like absolute garbage um so you know if they want to look at depression and anxiety they should probably start there um but I do think that you know even the physical comorbidities we still want to be here we don't want that to be you know we don't want to be removed or you know eradicated for those things we still have value Thank you. Um, and then Ira. Um, so I want to make one comment before I jump into Geshwin. I have seen quite a few non-autistic autism researchers in support of, of boycotting the study and saying that there are issues with it and all this stuff. And they're like, this is scary. Uh, and just a reminder, it's, it's scary for autistic researchers, but I'm I, I'm not an autism research, right? So I have a little bit of a buffer, but but it's scary for autistic researchers, and we we're we have to do it, right? It 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 affects our lives and the future lives of autistic people. We can't just sit here and not say anything. So it's a little frustrating when non-autistic researchers say, "Well, this is really scary," and it's like, yeah, think about how it is for an autistic person to speak up about this. I mean, against you know, or not against, but you know, in concern of research by autism experts when everyone renounces these people as autism experts. Um, so anyway, so I'll go ahead and go into Geshwind. Geshwind is a lot more of an open book in my opinion. Um, he is stated as calling autism a disease, as you saw in that video. Um, he is in the US, so it's likely that this study will probably use data from uh, uh, genetic data collected in the U.S. and be an international sort of study after Spectrum Take 10K happens. Um, Geshwin, I'm just going to read a quote from 2009 in a Spectrum article from what from him, and it it says, "If you're interested, even in a more abstract way, in human behavior and human cognition, autism is an extraordinary window into that. It involves dysfunction in social cognition, language." And then there's a hyphen and it says, the things that are really part of what makes us human. So going back to what Karen said about, um, you know, the idea of what is human and what is not, Geshwin apparently, at least in 2009, said that quote. So you can <laughs> make up your mind as to how he feels about autistic people or how he treats them. But um, he is in genetic research. He wants to look for genes for autism and he's 
been saying that for like many years. Uh, there's even a preprint study from Spectrum 10K researchers that hasn't been peer reviewed yet. And I have um, a lot more in detail uh, thing on my, on my Twitter about it. Uh, basically before they even recruited people on August 4th, uh, 2021, they had the study published or not published, sorry, it was not published, but it was a preprint and they're just looking at autism. Uh, the study's uh, title is Genetic Correlates of Phenotypic Heterogeneity and Autism. And they're looking at genetic research and the actual databases that they used include the Simon Simplex Collection, uh, the Autism Genetic Resource Exchange, the AIMS-2 trials, and SPARC. So they did use the SPARC database that's a United States genetic database of autistic people. So they've already basically kind of done what, you know, we're saying don't do, <laughs> but with a smaller sample. And um, so it's very hard to say, oh, you know, they're going to change. They're going to do all this other things. When in, tw in June 25th, on, on June 25th, Geshwin called autism a disease and talked about, you know, treating it. Um, I assume based on the context of that video, but that the, he, he used the word therapy, and I assume that means gene therapy um, because he's a genetic researcher. And people often say, oh, well, that's really far away. You know, they don't have the genes to do that and all this stuff. Um, well, currently in 2021 of January, there was a study that was stopped because, or not stopped, but it was paused because of side effects that children of Engelman syndrome children with Engelman syndrome were getting treated with gene therapy. Um, I don't know anything about the consent for that, you know, because they're children. Um, and they had leg weakness uh, because of the injections that they were getting. And so they paused the study. So there currently is gene therapy being used. And a lot of the funding and the backing from that project came from parents of children with Engelman syndrome. So you can say we are anti-eugenics all you want, or you know we are not trying to treat autism. But at the end of the day, if if there's something that's published and it it seems like they're willing to publish these markers, uh, whatever they find for autism, I don't think they didn't say that. Um, whatever they publish, basically, people can use like anyone can use that information to like create a company or like a parent who has a lot of money or like a company who wants to invest in autism treatments and parents will buy into that. You know, it's, it's a lot more tricky. It's not like we're trying to find a cause, a cure for cancer, right? Uh, Gashwin has also compared autism to cancer and gastric ulcers and pneumonia. So it's not looking great. <laughs> it's just not great. <laughs> that's, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, it's actually, it was really kind of brutal to read through, uh, to, to listen to his talks and read his research because it's it's uh, it's pathologizing, honestly. Thank you. And I think Tanya just wanted to add something. Yeah, I just really wanted to round it up. Um, Geshwind used to be tied to a, a group or a charity, I don't know what it was called, literally called Cure Autism Now, which then merged with Autism Speaks. So that isn't much more of a indication of what his motives are i mean he literally belonged to that company or charity and i watched a ucla symposium on youtube that he did back in 2018 and he literally said and i'm going to quote it i might, might get it wrong if we know the mechanism we can prevent it we can cure the autism speaking about finding um the genetic contributors or patterns i'm not a geneticist that essentially create autistic people so at least he's not hiding that and this is the co-lead of a project that tells us that we want children who can't consent and when we're anti-eugenics and this is going to benefit your well-being when the funding isn't even anything to do with that I mean do they really think that the autistic community are that bad at research Okay, I can see um, Holly's hand. I just want to check with Liz because I have I've realised that you can't use the private chat to let me know that if anyone wanted to talk. So please, 
just jump in. Yeah, no worries. I think I slightly missed my moment, um, but it was really covered really well by Priscilla. But I also just wanted to say, um, you know, whilst this is paused, it's only paused. It's not stopped. It's only paused. Um, and I think I really just want to acknowledge um, some of what I've heard is, is probably going to be quite triggering for people. But it's also the truth of the experience of what we're living with or dealing with today. But I just really wanted to acknowledge, you know, you guys have uh advocated um and battled for so long but even in this space now you know we've been going for some time and i just really would just wanted to say you know you're seen and you're heard but you know take your own pause yeah <laughs> whilst they are too yeah take your own pause thank you Thanks, Liz. And given that, yeah, I, I will miss um, hands up occasionally because I'm trying to look at multiple things. So please do just jump in um, if you're unable to see the private chat box. Um, and Holly. Um, to be honest, I think I was just probably going to reiterate something earlier, but with Gershwin obviously um, making it clear that he wants to cure autism, and then Simon Baron Cohen making it very clear through various interviews that he doesn't want to cure it, but he just wants to kind of, you know, uh, cherry pick a few of his favorites and then cure the rest of it you know they're basically coming in the same from what i can tell they're basically coming in at the same angle but just narratively coming at it slightly differently but re re realistically it's the same thing um he wants to cure autism for everybody but his little maths boys so um you know i think it's pretty clear what their intentions are thank you and then david so do you want to kind of explain, because we've got a comment or a note, haven't we, for this this part of the discussion? Yeah, so um, Ira, you know, mentioned about, you know, gene editing isn't a technology that is years away. You know, it is here now. And one example of it is something called CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9. And if I just go to my notes quickly, because I do have some notes here. Um, so CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Um, and the Cas9 part stands for CRISPR-Associated Protein 9. Basically what it is, is um, it's a bacterial defense mechanism. And uh, from, from that, they, they've sort of adapted it so that they can use it to unzip DNA and then target specific genes, and they can disrupt what they consider mutations or defective genes. They can remove them. You know, you can literally alter DNA with this technology. And, you know, just, you know, if you just look on the internet, you know, if you search CRISPR Cas9 or CRISPR in autism, you know, straight away what comes up is stuff on Spectrum News reporting on studies such as one where they're injecting uh, the gene editing tool CRISPR into the brains of adolescent mice to counteract the effects of mutations in what they consider to be autism genes, um, you know, and, you know, obviously there's also been this research in Angelman syndrome, um, and, you know, that's a good example of why, you know, gene editing is, there's still work to be done with that, and why, you know, there's some ethical issues to be raised, because one of the problems with CRISPR is it, they can't guarantee that it's, it's specificity, you know, it, it, it may affect more than just the targeted gene, you know, and it may have knock-on effects for more than just the system that that gene controls. Um, so, the, you know, when you consider that they're literally doing research into injecting this into the brains of adolescent mice, we're not even talking about... They have done research on fetal brains in mice as well, but they're literally suggesting that they can they're hoping that this research can lead to an ability to remove the autism uh, as if, you know, that's not a terrifying thought um, from, from people, you know, up to adolescence, potentially, um, you know, that's the implications at least um, whether they can actually do it or not still remains to be seen. But I find that deeply disturbing when you consider that, being autistic is is a fundamental part of who we are. You know, our entire experiences, the way we interact with people, the way people interact with us, the way we think about and view the world is based on being autistic. When you consider that people are trying to develop technologies to take that away from us, it's not just curing us of a disease, because it's not a disease. It is fundamentally changing who we are as an individual. 
Thank you. Um, and Kieran. I just want to um, dial it back a little bit, I think, from looking at this from a kind of apparent perspective, if I was coming at this with no understanding of, you know, my, I've just found out that my child might be autistic or my child's just been diagnosed. And the things that we are talking about here are huge and extreme and could sound conspirational. And, you know, all of those it could sound like, you know, like we're just, we're just whipping each other up kind of thing. Um, but we're not. And that's the really scary thing here, which is why I, think it is so fundamental i mean the first thing that anybody should be taught about autism is the history of it and how awful it is and how these narratives are embedded in the last hundred years of autism history i mean literally it's it's eugenics it's people being deficient in some part of humanity or having deficits or you know the dehumanizing rhetoric it's all framed around that and that's led us up and people are kind of i've seen comments all over the last few weeks saying like oh i'm shocked by this i haven't been shocked by this and i'm sure nobody else here has been shocked by it as well because we understand the narratives because we've explored them we're embedded in them and you know david's talking about CRISPR, and we're talking about gene editing and the potential for these things and and experiments on mice i mean that's geshwind all over i mean we were reading a study the other day over twitter about um autistic mice you're only a, you're only an autistic mice if you bury three marbles um, these are real things that are happening in the world of research and it's crackers absolutely balmy it's the whole thing is ridiculous but yet we're still here talking about these things and and I don't want to go too far because I know Tanya is going to say something kind of very similar that's going to follow this. But, you know, when we're dehumanizing people, the people that feel this are us. And it's us as children that hear this and feel this and take this on and which generates stigma and which generates self-hate and which generates this whole, these generations of autistic people that we have who don't like themselves who think they're at fault, who think they're at broken, and whose parents are struggling to help them as teenagers and as adults and as young adults and even getting into like full adulthood that absolutely despise themselves and don't want to be here. And the reason for that is not because they are broken, as Simon Baron Cohen would have us think, as Daniel Geshfind was have us think. It's because of people like that who have created the narratives around us that tell us that we're broken when we're not. So I just wanted to dial things back a bit. And, you know, for parents that are new to this, that is, this is overwhelming and probably quite scary and terrifying. And you probably just want to switch off from it. But it's so important that you do not, because these are future generations that are going to be impacted. Your children, their grandchildren, and onwards and onwards are going to be impacted by stuff like this if it goes ahead. Because if it does go ahead in the way that they want it to, it will be built upon and will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it will be unassailable. So we have to do something now. Um, and somebody in the comments, you know, said, don't forget, because obviously we do keep coming back to the point of children and parents and this study and somebody saying, don't forget the adults. Um, absolutely, we haven't. Um, I guess we're focusing to some extent because we want to reach those parents to get them to think critically before they hand over their young people's DNA. We are hoping that adult autistics will be able to engage, okay, if they can't engage with our video today, can they engage with the plain summaries that we've given about our concerns, those kinds of things. So we're hoping to reach anybody really just to be critical of this study. Um, we can't actually tell you, don't do this study. I'd like to be able to do that and people listen, but actually we want you to just be critical. Um, and, and obviously we, like I say, we keep hammering the, home the point about young people and their parents making the decision because those children really don't have any control over that situation at all. Um, so don't worry, we haven't forgotten the adult autistics as well. And, and particularly if they are vulnerable autistic adults that maybe somebody else will be also um, handing over their DNA without their true understanding or knowledge or consent. Um, I think I've lost where I said uh, I was going to go to next. I think it's Monique. Wonderful. So this is just a point and it's about something that Kieran said where he said, you know, there are lots of us who know 
the narrative. And this is really important because I think that people, autistic people from all walks of life in all intersections should be involved in research, right? Um, and they should certainly inform through things like co-production. They should have, like, it, the, the responsibility should be shared in that way. But you will also notice that it appears that there are no autistic autism researchers contributing to this project. And the reason that I highlight this is the fact that there are a lot of us that know the history, that know biology, that know genetics, that know the problems with DSM and subtyping. subtyping. There are a lot of autistic autism professionals who know the issue with creating categories. For example, I've seen um, <laughs> a young male child be diagnosed with female autism because he wasn't like exceedingly masculine. These are exceptionally problematic things, right? Um, I've seen children get denied diagnosis because they have friends and are kind. Um, but my point is that there, there are a lot of us across the entire range of expertise. Like I know at least a hundred probably in some way by name. Um, and the fact that there is a complete absence of autistic people who have all of this knowledge should be a red flag because it is a huge project with a large team and there would be space for it. Um, and that means that either they have decided that they will not be involved or they were not invited to be involved and they should be involved alongside autistic people of the general public. Um, but the complete absence of it should be a red flag. And particularly, like you say, my interest for a long time has been not related to what's going on specifically in the biomarkers, etc., of people's brains uh, and what have you. Um, so I'm a little bit tired, so that's not actually the word I wanted. Um, but I focus, like a lot of us, more on actually stigma reduction and how to improve autistic people's well-being and so on, because we have recognised that it's outside of us, it's not inside of us that the issues um, come from. Um, and I'm going to move on now, I believe, to Ira. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to go back to the preprint that I mentioned before. The Spectrum 10K re researchers have already done this other study looking at genetic correlates of autism. And I just wanted to explain what exactly they're correlating this with. Um, so when they say autism, right, what they're doing is they're using surveys and questionnaires and often parent report questionnaires to then correlate that to some genetic score that, you know, all this fancy science stuff, right? But they're trying to basically find genes that correlate with this questionnaire. So what they're doing, like, the the only way that this research is going to make sense is if the questionnaire actually diagnoses or measures autism right and the questionnaires they're using are our parent report questionnaires um one is the social communication questionnaire and the other is the repetitive behavior scale revised um questionnaire and these are all parent report right so they're getting these like statements that are for like i don't have I can't uh, like tell you the exact statements and all that because of copyright, but generally what they're doing is they're asking like, did, did my child, did your child look at you? Do they point at stuff? Do they do these things? And it's all about doing, right? It's not about the experience of the autistic person. And so the problem is, is that there are plenty of autistic people who do point, who do make eye contact, who do all of those things, it, all of these questionnaires are often based on stereotypes and they're also generally for younger children for like, you know, um, 10, 10 years or younger or something like, like something like that, right? Because these are not children that are filling out the report themselves. So it's all of this behavior that's then they're trying to correlate how, how these like children move, whether they line toys up, whether they do certain things, and so they're missing a giant amount of autistic people who don't have an offic official diagnosis because, you know, the diagnostic criteria is um, like, like 
people who diagnose it like don't understand that like it's not only white people who are autistic or it's not only you know cis people or it's not only men <laughs> um and so there all of these studies including spectrum 10k is looking at officially diagnosed autistic people so that's not everyone who's autistic and we know that and we know there are 80 year olds who are autistic and never got a diagnosis so it just doesn't make sense right like it, it just it doesn't it doesn't show you anything about the genetic makeup of autism or even if they were trying to do that what they're doing is they're taking behaviors and they're correlating them with the genes and they're going oh well this one had um and also even the questionnaires look at self-harm behavior do you think that's genetic is that innate as some whether someone self-harms or not um or you know how bad they're like uh simon baron cohen mentioned mental health as a co-occurring condition to look at in the study i mean we know these things are not just innately genetic. We know it's based on environment, whether autistic people are supported, whether they're accommodated, whether people understand sensory sensitivities, which there were no sensory sensitivity questionnaires used for that study that was um, that was put out on online. So it's just not going to help anyone. <laughs> and that's that's my opinion on about it. But it doesn't make sense when you really do look at it from a science perspective. I, I don't even know what they're, I, I don't know if they know what they're even trying to find, right? They just want to collect the DNA and then do these correlations and see if there's something that's significant. That's, that's what it seems like, at least. Yeah, it does definitely just feel like DNA data mining, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do with it later, um, which is a, it's a problem. Okay, so I'm conscious that we've been going for a while. Um, so we're going to just just very briefly, because they all, again, it's, these are all just the main points from our statement. Again, you're welcome to obviously read that in full if you haven't already. And there is a plain summary version, which is shorter. It's only six pages. Um, but just to say what these uh, last key points, but we really have touched on all of these now. So our um, fifth concern was the conflict of interest between the researchers and what they say, what they do, what they've done in the past and so on. Um, so we've really covered that, I think, in quite a bit of depth. Um, so, yeah, they've not publicly um, explained um, or disclosed their conflicts of interest in relation to other studies they've done. And actually their, their, their interests, their background and so on, hasn't been very clear. We've obviously covered the ethical issues, um, but part of what we actually want to know is um, any and all ethical, ethical issues that were discussed during the ethical review of this particular study. So we actually want to see that um, and that should be access, um, you know, freely accessible. Um, then the seventh point is ethical issues and transparency. So given the disparities between what the study was awarded funding for and what they are telling the public, and on the information and consent forms, we expect to be told if there was a substantial amendment submitted by the study. So that's just a, the, the final point. Um, and I guess that's just really, really coming back to this whole point that what they got funding for was to work out if they could find autism in the DNA um, and to work on if they could make subtypes. And I feel like there was a third thing. What was the third thing, Ira? Anyone else remember? <laughs> We've looked at this so often now. I have the list, I have to scroll up. Um, combine them with other data sets, identify several genetic variants that contribute to autism. Uh, improve autism diagnosis, I think is the last one. Thank you. And like I say, and then work out if they can make subtypes. That is what they received funding for. There was no comment there about this flowery idea of improving autistic well-being. There was nothing about looking um, at some of the things that they listed, like epilepsy, depression, anxiety, all those sorts of things that they've been um, talking about on those public platforms. There is a big disparity between what they got funding for and what they're actually telling the public. So they were our key, uh, like our final point. Um, OK, so we, we are getting towards the end. Um, I have got a few questions that we've pulled from the comment section that I felt um, and that others have felt we haven't actually covered. So hopefully we've covered the majority of people's questions. And um, please also remember that we are not part of this study. So we are only able to answer um, what we've gleaned from looking into this in a lot of depth. But we can't tell you uh, all the answers um, about their motivations and so on, other than what we've seen 
um, publicly and um, when we've done looked into the background of the research. Um, so I've got here as um, one of our wrapping up points almost um, towards the end. Um, so Monique, if you're, I think, all right. Oh, sorry, have I missed somebody? I'm conscious that I might have missed somebody. Hold on. I said I. No, because that's for the next bit. Sorry, I'm getting really, really confused. But I don't think I've missed anybody now. OK, that's good. Um, Monique, yes, do you know we're on to um, money for this study? Wonderful. So um, if not this, then what else effectively? Um, so the first thing I'm going to point out is that there is a limited amount of funding that goes to all research in the UK each year. That's just taken a hit um, for many reasons. Um, including the fact that the government is no longer paying as much money into um, UKRI, which is the governing research body in the UK, um, which means that funding is even more limited. Now, when you apply for a grant, um, let me first say that like success usually um, is between 2% and maybe 10%, right? Which means that between 2 and 10% of the people who apply will get funding. If not genetic research, then what? Well, first of all, services are dire in that a lot of them actually aren't evidence-based and they are routinely failing autistic people. Um, autistic people are more likely um, to die early, for example, but one of the leading causes of that is suicide. We do not actually have a lot of robust research into preventing suicide in autistic people. Um, we don't have robust um, a robust evidence base into uh, the therapy that might work for autistic people. Um, we don't have a robust evidence base into, um, for example, meeting autistic people's educational needs. We don't even have robust evidence for diagnosis. Um, and that becomes even more limited depending on for example, the racial bias that we have in autism research, um, the gender bias that we have, the sexuality bias, in that we don't pick up people who don't look like the stereotype of autism because the stereotype of autism was born out of autism research. So in terms of where that funding could go, the things that we think that are actually worthwhile are the things that could intervene um, to produce better outcomes for autistic people in the environments that we are in. That means better diagnostic services, which are inclusive of the entirety um, of existence, right? So stop generating research. That means that we only pick up white, cisgender, straight, male, middle-class kids. Um, it means creating an evidence base for services that mean that autistic children, young people, adolescents, adults, older adults, everyone can access mental health services on time with an evidence base for something that is going to work to lessen the chances of anxiety, depression, PTSD and other co-occurring mental health issues. It, For example, like one of the reasons I'm so angry about this study actually is that recently we applied and we're still waiting to hear back, but for a grant to understand the occurrences of victimization in the autistic community and how we can support um, autistic people um, who have been victimized through things like shelters. Right now, that is a very applied thing that would make a, a difference to autistic people who at that moment are vulnerable to things like long-term post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and yet, this isn't the first time that someone has applied for funding to do research around intimate um, partner abuse, which autistic people experience more often, and yet it gets denied and the funding didn't go through. And it's not that it's not a good study. Um, it's literally that instead people are spending three million or just over three million pounds on doing genetic research. And it is a finite pot of money. So every pound that goes to genetic research on autism does not go to services. It does not go to research on very important issues. 
um, and it is a very direct choice. Um, there are a multitude of things. The research that autistic people tend to want done tend to be around services, and this is based in research on very wide groups, and also the same with families. The, the research that families tend to want, um, it, it tends to be about services, and it tends to be about interventions which make a direct impact, accessible schools, accessible environments, accessible society, accepting society. Um, and this actually in the list of priorities was 26, right? So you, you cannot get any lower than this. I'm pretty sure it was either the second last or the last one on the priority list. It does not meet the top of the list for autistic people, non-autistic parents, autistic parents, carers, anyone. The only people who keep going on and on, on and on about this tend to be autism researchers. Um, so effectively, I'm saying that money could go just about anywhere else. Thank you. Um, and kind of really um, building on that as well. So Tanya and Liz, I believe, um, talking about where actually, yes, the money could or should be going. Hi, thanks, Chloe. Yeah, so me and Liz just, you know, we work uh, on the ground really with autistic children and their families. And there is just so much wrong at the minute. It's like this obsession with normality is kind of filtered in insipidly into social care and education and health. And anything that deviates from the normal is a massive risk. I mean, we've just had, um, you know, Luke Clements at the University of Leeds did a paper on institutionalised parent and carer blame. We've got, um, you know, parents of autistic children, one in five of them will be investigated by social services for safeguarding because of the lack of understanding of what it means to be a neurodivergent family. Like CAMS kills kids because there is that lack of basic understanding of autistic experience. Again, which comes back to because the only research and stuff that is championed is really outdated stuff that comes from Simon Baron Cohen. Um, Liz, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I just say, uh, personally speaking, and with the communities I'm connected with, um, the data isn't even there, it doesn't even exist. Um, but what we do know is um, children that might look like me um, are likely not to even have a diagnosis and have already been labelled as bad, naughty. And, you know, there's the prison, uh, school to prison pipeline as well. Um, and I'm just really horrified that in the light of COVID, this large amount of money is going to that when I would have thought we would have been trying to build things better, do things differently, um, not add harm, not cause trauma. Um, so it is really shocking. It's shocking when uh, many of the children that I'm connected to are waiting two years to four years for a diagnosis and they're only the ones that may eventually get one. Um, and, and that's going to have a really big impact on, on, on their outcomes when it means if you're waiting four years, then you're not going to get what you need put in place. Um, you know, I, it just horrifies me. It's really hard to find the words, but um, it's horrifying that this is the angle we're going in, in the light of COVID. I mean, why are we not even looking at how that affected um, the autistic community and those with um, disabilities when it came to how that was dealt with, as well as uh, black and brown communities? And how how is, you know, long COVID affecting people with autism? Because I know that that's something else that I'm dealing with um, within the community that's really showing up. Um, so, you know, why are we adding harm? Why aren't we um, finding ways to help heal? Um, yeah, and it's, it's hard to find all the words, but, um, you know, and also again, when our children are turned away from mental health services because they have a diagnosis, so it's all a catch 22. Yeah, and it could really, really simply well, I'm not saying we could fix it all, but 
if we could just get the education of proper autistic experience and the autistic led research that is out there and explains so much of our experience, which is not that complex and replace the tripe that people like Simon Baron Cohen have built their entire careers and been knighted for, it would make such a huge impact on services just to understand that. I think that would be my primary focus and that we could there could be you know an autistic led training as well we you know we could do so much with three million pounds we do not lack empathy it, that's not the case we don't have extreme male brains we're not all maths geniuses we're all monotropic thinkers and we all have double empathy and we all mask which isn't which is a trauma response, but that's autistic led research. But so that doesn't get through. We just get Senkos going, well, they can't be autistic because they have friends. Or we get mental health services not diagnosing people that do not present in the way that Simon Baron Cohen has built his career on perpetuating the myth that they should. Yeah. And I, and I also see that. Um this could be very divisive for the autistic community. I mean, it already is. Um, and it's simply just not okay. It's not ethical. And it, it's draining. It's draining. And I, and I see and I feel that in the room. It, it's draining and, it, and it's tr triggering and it's traumatizing. And... Um, Something needs to be done differently, but this isn't this isn't it. This, this isn't it. And I also would like to ask um, Priscilla and Holly as well. What where do we want this money going um, or any other key points about this part of the discussion? Um, who wouldn't mind? Priscilla or Holly? Oh, sorry. I'm going to go with Holly because I think Holly was about to speak and then we'll come back to Priscilla. Yeah, I mean, as someone who was diagnosed at the age of 39, which meant that I was, you know, based on my knees mental health wise by that point, it is incredibly infuriating that they got the amount of media coverage that they got, um, completely biased media coverage, I should add, you know, given that none of them seemed to bring in, you know, two perspectives, which is what apparently journalism is supposed to be about. Um, and they mostly, with some exceptions, focused on Simon Baron Cohen and co. Um, but they could have used that attention to help educate the pu public, you know, the millions of people who saw it, they could have helped, you know, actually, there's, you know, highlight the variety and the wide diversity of autistic people and the fact that we're not all little white boys and the fact that we might have arts backgrounds, we might be, you know, um, non-binary or women or trans or anything, or, you know, people of colour, they could have used that amazing amount of media coverage and advertising money that they put in just to educate the public so that people don't get to the age of 39 and have no idea who they are. And I know I sound emotional it's because I am, you know, it, it, they could have done so much good already with what they with, with to the, for the actually autistic people instead of, you know, their own egos, their own career paths um, and, you know, inflating them, their sense of selves as opposed to helping us, which is what they're supposed to be doing. Thank you. And Priscilla? Yeah, I mean, there's so much that it is infuriating when I think about what this money could be spent on. It is, it is really infuriating. Uh, just even on education and employment, like two massive, massive areas that even the, re the research shows that autistic parents, autistic people are so concerned about. Um, you know, how much training does the average teacher get on neurodivergence? How to support neurodivergent kids in the classroom? Um, you know, how much are teacher assistants paid? How consistent is their teacher assistant? Are they just getting a locum that comes in or, you know, uh, uh, is coming in on a temporary basis and then it changes and then they have to learn again how to work with this child? You know, things like this research into what support measures we can have in schools of mixed abilities where we can really actually tangibly support people and not have this one size fits all education model that doesn't work for anyone. Um, and in, in terms of employment, you know, there's this, 
the statistic that came out that there's 22%, just 22% of ad autistic adults own any kind of employment. So what, you know, what are we doing about that? We're putting all this sort of advertising that we want to hire neurodivergent people and it's trendy now. But when you actually talk to the average employer, the average HR person about neurodiversity, they have no idea. They actually have no idea how to, to treat the, uh, treat neurodivergent people in the office. The amount of times that I've had to advocate for myself to just get reasonable adjustments, just to just get noise cancelling headphones. <laughs> I had to talk to so many different people because they didn't understand my request. Just simple things like that. They do not understand how, you know, that being in an open plan office can be completely disruptive, can, can cause you know, anxiety because you're trying to do your work and there's people talking around you. There's just so much that could be done in, in, in helping make working environments more suitable and, and better for everyone, really, because it's not just about us. It's making it better for everyone because everyone could have a better tailored, in, you know, support. Um, so, yeah, it's just a dearth of, of you know, just a lack of fundamental things. Even just the other day, I was looking for as services for, for service dogs, there is one uh, one organization in the whole of UK that caters for adults for service dogs, and that costs about £12,000 or something like this. So <laughs> there's so much that needs to be done, so much. I can't even, you know, begin to, <laughs> yeah, it'll just be a whole rant. So, yeah. <laughs> all oh, so valuable points though um and i also want to flag um tanya who i kind of uh, it's one of those things where you know them on twitter but you don't know them know them so tanya's really important point which is um these people have never listened to non-speakers um I, i'm hoping that's directed at the study and and not us um but they say these people have never listened to non-speakers i would want the money to go to whatever they say as well so going back to um so tanya's a really amazing advocate trying to um, amplify the voices of non-speakers um, so again that's another the money having to go there because um, something that Tanya mentions let me find it sorry because it's there's a lot of comments now um, I saw something uh, uh, hold on sorry here it is communication is a human rights uh, 170,000 plus UK autistics don't have access to communication it's things like that that's that's you know those sorts of things as well which comes back as well to what Priscilla's saying is is communication as well that we need better money and services going into helping us communicate um, our needs whether we're non-speaking or um, situationally mute and so on and so forth um, so thank you for that point as well Tanya um, Dave has just asked if he can jump in yes yeah so I obviously um I, I tend to support autistic adults, especially autistic adults who have, you know, uh, co-occurring addiction issues, mental health issues. And I myself have been one of those autistic ad adults with addiction issues and mental health issues. And I know that in the UK, um, you know, it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing to have to go through the treatment services here, you know, um, Let's even if I wasn't autistic, the first thing you come up against when you are an addict and you have mental health problems is you go to the addiction service and they go, Well, we can't help you until your mental health problems are fixed. And you go to the mental health service and they go, Well, we can't help you till you've stopped taking drugs and drinking. So immediately you're falling through the cracks. But then when you throw in being autistic on top of it, you've got service well, you've got services going, Well, you can't be autistic because autistic people don't don't suffer from addiction. And then you've got the mental health service is going, well, no, I don't think it's addiction. I think it's, uh, I mean, in my case, they told me I had a cluster B personality disorder for years um, uh, because they couldn't tell the difference between harmful stims and self-harming behavior. Um, and uh, what what this all added up to was I, I ended up institutionalized twice because I, I could not cope in in the world. And I won't get into that, but it was a very traumatic experience for me, especially the second time. Um, and I just look and I think, you know what, three million pound, you could you could train these services, you could give them appropriate resources, 
you know, at the moment, autistic adults are not all right. There is a good chance that a lot of autistic adults, having gone through all this stuff about Spectrum 10K, are going to be turning up in their GP's office and saying, I'm not all right. And they're going to go through those services that I went through and that it's not going to be good enough. And then people wonder why we have such high suicide rates. You know, three million pounds could do a lot to to support those people, um, to support us as a community. Um, and yeah, you know, obviously, services for children are abysmal. But let's not forget that it doesn't get any better once you're an adult either. Currently, and this money could have been so better spent. Thank you. I'm going to come to um, Kieran in a moment to kind of give us the main take home message that we have. Then I've got a couple of questions that we pulled from the comment section. I need to double check that we haven't already answered them, which we might have done. Um, and then I think we're going to finish on um, hopefully a relatively what can we do or positive note to some extent. Um, I just wanted to kind of add as well, I think, just to something that Monique kind of brought up as well. Um, which is that autistic, I don't class myself and I wouldn't class myself as an autistic autism researcher because I don't buy into this idea of autism spectrum disorder. It's too abstract. So I would be wanting to class myself, I guess, as an autistic autistic culture researcher. I don't know. We'll, 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 we'll work out what that means. What's really frustrating is the energy that as autistic people in academia, for instance, the amount of time and energy we're spending just to try and survive in, in a really ableist academia. And I'm really aware of my structural advantage of even being able to be in academia at all. Um, but the issue I have is the work that I want to do to, to um, get funding grants for my pre and post diagnostic support program for autistic people. We need that. That's something that's needed. Um, other work that we do and that, that Manit does on um, looking at how positive autistic identity, connection to the culture and so on, how that actually improves also well-being outcomes and so on. The issue I have is I'm exhausted and I can't even put in those applications. I really struggle. I, I don't publish. Um, and that's that's a big no-no when you're an academic. You know, I, I, I'm not getting anywhere because I'm too busy, one, trying to survive, and two, fighting things like S10K and things. And I'm not trying to be like, poor worries me. My point is that the research and the work that I want to be doing is the work that's actually needed. Um, and I think Monique, is it fair to say you would agree? Like we're talking about, like I say, I want my pre and post diagnostic support program out there. I can't get there at this point in time. And now I'm just feeling sorry for myself. So I'm going to stop that. Um, Thank you in for a second to add to that, but also that our knowledge gets stolen. And this is something that Chloe and I talk about. It needs to be said now and it needs to end now. Non-autistic autism researchers are building their careers off of the backs of autistic people. There are so many structural issues that mean that autistic people fall away in the system of academia and they consult certain autistic people sometimes right? And they don't appreciate the genuine value of insider knowledge. They have no idea that this has been built up over decades, centuries, because collectively, all we're trying to do is survive. So we build up mechanisms, we build up programs, but they don't count as science because we don't have the ability necessarily to get them published in the way that they need to be published or studied in the way that they need to be studied. And non-autistic autism researchers often fill that void, but they do it disingenuously and they steal insider knowledge and become the people who get credited with it. And I have a very, very special hate in my heart for that process and the way that it affects autistic people, including autistic academics, who are still struggling to keep houses over their heads. And also the fact that then the things that autistic people have built up in their cultures and their communities to support other autistic people become the inventions of non-autistic autism researchers. Um, and I'm sick of seeing it happening. 
And if you're a non-autistic autism researcher who has done that, I do not think you can class yourself as an ally. Either you work with autistic people um, to get their knowledge out there, um, otherwise it's stealing. And yes, Just and it. I and that's a whole thing. I've had to have a conversation with with Renique because again, I was in tears last week because of that exact thing. And and I can't go into lots of detail. Um, but basically the work Annette and I've been doing on the ground with autistic people, meaning we didn't have the energy in the spoons to make it research. So we were working with autistic people, creating things, creating programs to support them. Years of us doing that. And then you see a non-autistic person as a researcher doing what we've done and not yeah, it's 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 really really problematic. It's really problematic, and it's soul destroying. It's because it's it's round the other way. We're working on the ground, and then we want to get money to show that what we're doing is working, so we can then get it out into the community. Whereas you see autistic, uh, oh sorry, autism researchers and non-autistic people, they come from the other direction. They come from the let's get funding and create something by asking the community what they want and what they do already and that kind of thing. It's, it's really problematic. Um, I feel like Monique, before we go on to Kieran, you wanted to add something too. Is that right? I think I've lost the. Oh, address the behaviors of ambassadors. So, Mine is a very direct appeal to the Spectrum K10 team who invited ambassadors to be part of the study that have not been addressing their behavior on social media. I am watching autistic advocates who have worked for so long and so hard disappearing off social media because of pylons um, from ambassadors who are posting openly hateful and transphobic and often racially charged content onto social media. So this is a direct appeal to take responsibility for the fact that you have put people in positions of power and they are harming people on social media. It is time to take action and address that issue. It can not be condoned by any study anywhere that their ambassadors are putting hateful content which marginalizes already exceptionally marginalized groups even further. We should not be seeing people and advocates who have worked their whole life basically to support autistic people being effectively bullied off of Twitter for being concerned or for thinking that trans people are in fact just men and women and non-binary and valid. Like we should not be seeing this. Address it now. You cannot keep hiding from it. And we are aware that people have sent concerns about the behavior of your ambassadors. You really need to start to address that. Absolutely, thank you. And and um, while that's not in our key um, comments that we've made today, that is in our fuller statement. Like I say, the statement is very long. I, I promise you we've been as thorough as we possibly could um, in, in such a short space of time. Um, so I think I'm going to go to Kieran. And this is really, I guess, to explain what well, what what are we actually asking? What's the take home message? What's the point of us even <laughs> having this conversation today? Um. <clears throat> the whole um the, the the point of this was to talk to parents and autistic people to convince them to think critically not to say don't take part because we cannot as Chloe said earlier we cannot tell you not to take part but please 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 think about the things that we've addressed tonight read the statement if you can think about it yourself think about how superficial everything is and just dig a little bit deeper that's that's really what we want to ask of people because this is going to sound really depressing but we as a group of people who came to write that statement and have been talking about this incessantly over the past three weeks pretty much 24 hours a day we came at this knowing that we cannot stop this study going ahead 
that's the reality of what's going to go on here. We've talked about Baron Cohen, we've talked about Geshvin, we've talked about the uh, amount of power that these people have and the fact that very clearly they've been handed £3 million to commit a study without actually really going into too much detail about exactly what they're going to be doing with it. And I said earlier about Baron Cohen having a golden ticket, and he does have that golden ticket. His name attached to things gets doors opened and people just accept things and things flow through. I said that that was depressing. Just because we think that we cannot stop this completely does not mean that we just give up. We haven't. Over the past three weeks, not just us, I'm not just talking about the people on the screen right now, but hundreds and thousands of autistic people have been tweeting, have been writing blogs, have been making comments on Facebook, have been writing letters to MPs, to the Spectrum 10K people themselves, have been working so hard, and that's indicative of one thing. All of us have value, and none of us deserve the crap that we are getting. And I'm not just talking about Spectrum 10K. We have covered a whole broad range of topics tonight. Every time some of us get together, those of you that watch us fairly regularly, we talk about the narratives of awful things that are going on around us that we have very little control over. But that does not mean that we cannot go down without a fight. We can't stop fighting. We have to keep going. We have to use this as a relay where we pass, we get tired and we pass the baton on to someone else who passes it on to someone else. And we kick and we fight and we punch and we make them bleed. That's the only way that we get anywhere. And that has to happen now. What we really aim to get from this is to make sure that this study is slowed down, that people stop and think critically about it, and we make sure that studies like this do not go ahead in the future, that we make enough noise that people sit up and take notice and really question things, question the ethics behind this, question the value to research like this, which we have dissected very clearly tonight. And this sounds impassioned and it sounds emotioned, but we are not just angry people for no reason. We are angry with a purpose and for very good reason, because we have spent generations being shat upon. And it needs to stop. It absolutely needs to stop. And the place we start stopping that is by drawing the line in academia. Don't contribute to things without looking into them carefully. Absolutely do not do that because you're not helping anyone. You're not helping yourself, you're not helping your children, and you're not helping future generations of autistics. It needs to stop now. So we fight and we bloody their nose. And that's our aim for this. So if anybody at home there is taking away from this, you know, it's depressing, there's nothing we can do. There is so much you can do. You can sign our letter, which is going off to the Spectrum 10K people, which is going to the HRA who oversee the, the research that goes ahead and oversees the Spectrum 10K study. There is letter templates to MPs on the Academy website where you can write to your MP and it just fill in your name. If you agree with it, it's got the letter attached to it, the statement attached to it, send it off to your MP. Do these things. They may feel meaningless when you're doing it individually, but collectively when we make a move and we make our voices heard, things happen. This pause hasn't happened because they wanted it to happen. This pause has happened because we have made noise. So if we can make them stop for a second, we can make them stop for a minute. We can make them stop for an hour. We can slow things down and make sure that this stuff doesn't happen in the future or that if it does happen, it happens correctly. Baron Cohen in his statement the other day said, asked the question, the very disingenuous and rhetorical question, do autistic people not want any genetic research? The answer to that is no, of course we want genetic research. We want these things to be supported, but we want the people doing it to be open and honest and on side with us and not hide their intentions behind a cloud of disingenuousness. Draw that line, critically think and ask questions. Be that annoying autistic that asks why, 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 why. Do those things and then things like this stop happening. Thank you, Kieran. Death clapping. Um, I feel like we should just like end there, but we've still got a couple. I apologise. And if you are still here, you amazing people, thank you. Um, so can I, Ira, if you don't mind, we do at the very end of our statement have um, two, I think, really reasonable demands. 
Um, Ira, if I can hand over to you. Uh, sure. So from the statement, I'm just reading this uh, verbatim, it says, due to the above, we insist on the full publication of the full application as it was approved for funding in order for full transparency of the study to be reached. We also insist on the reevaluation of the study by the ethics awarding body. Um, and I think I think asking for to see the the actual grant application this was rewarded for is a pretty reasonable ask, and it's not uh, it's not an uncommon it's not it's not something that's confidential or anything like this is something that researchers ask for before, and it's it's not um, it's reasonable. <laughs> so that's what we're asking for. <laughs> I just want to double check because I know David. David, would it make sense if I if we just quickly address just a couple of questions from the comments that I feel we didn't answer, or would it make sense for your your final remark? No, uh, answer the questions first. I'll I I can wait. Yeah, I just I was hoping because you said that potentially yours might be a little bit because this is a, I know for everybody if you're here listening etc as well and and watching it, it is a very draining um, um discussion so hopefully david might have something just to go away with usually when we're on academy because we talk about so many sensitive topics we do the what's your favorite stim but i don't think we're doing that today um questions from the comments that i quickly grabbed earlier on there's been so many comments so many fantastic um discussions going on but these are some things that maybe we've not addressed or answered um, so for instance even just a basic one which body regulates this research please um, I think for us it as far as we're aware it will be things like HRA so the health research is that right Ira's nodding as well would there be any other bodies um, outside of that uh, yet yeah, Monique um. so they would have put in an ethics application with the NHS to be able to um, collect data through an NHS trust um, and also any of the bodies that funds it um, has a role in that too, which um, I believe one of that was the, the Welcome Trust. Okay, yeah. So hopefully that's, that's answered that person's question. Um, next question, what can be done to stop it? Is stopping it possible? I guess particularly um, in Kieran's sort of impassioned speech just now, um, we don't really have any or hold out any hope that we're necessarily going to be able to stop this study. Um, like Kieran says, we just want to make it really hard for them, for S10K, and actually make it really hard for any type of study like this in the future. Um, I think, Ira. Um, and also, if there are, there is a way to, um, if and for any study that the HRA approves, if there's um, issue, if you think there's issues in terms of ethicalness, um, there's an email contact that you can send to them to like, just let them know if you have issues or think that there's any sort of ethical concerns with the study. Thank you. Um, any other comment? I can see Monique, yeah. Um, one of the goals, even if we don't stop this, is to make it so unpopular that funders think twice um, because we have raised a lot of ethical issues and the point about all of this is letting funders know that if they're going to fund stuff like this a it has to be better thought out b it needs to be a lot less problematic um, and c also don't um, and that is part of what we're doing at the moment um, so part of this is being loud including being loud if you can on social media um, because no one likes bad publicity um, and we need to make sure that this becomes an undesirable type of research while autistic people are dying and not having the supports that they need. Um, yeah. Um, and the final question, like I said, I might have missed loads, but I, I was trying to get ones that we probably hadn't touched on. So what impact will stopping S10K have given that they already have 90K? I guess, or 90,000, um, I guess we're coming back to the exact same point. I'm gonna to come to Ira, and if anyone else has got any points about this as well. Um, so I'm just gonna finish the full question though. So it's what impact will stopping S10K have given that they already have 90,000 um, data samples? Um, is there a legal challenge which can be considered to effectively outlaw what is essentially enabling eugenics happening under the pretense of medical help? 
Um, so Ira and anybody else, um, feel free to raise a hand. So if you want to answer the on. first question, the paper that was pre-printed, um, essentially they said, like, I, I'm not sure completely because I'd have to go back and reread everything and be very thorough, but essentially it sounded like they needed a bigger sample size to find, you know, find the genes that correlate. So in that way, it sounds like they do need more data sets and they might in the future think about doing more of these kind of studies. And so by speaking up about it, we can, you know, hopefully they'll think twice before doing the same kind of study again. So actually, I guess to address that person's question, that the impact of stopping S10K actually could be a good um, like so I don't really think, and uh, um, I mean, it would be lovely if we could actually get them to completely re-evaluate whether this study should be even happening. Um, but even if that were the case, that would be a roadblock in them collecting a much greater data set. Is that what uh, Ira was saying? And yeah. Tanya? Hi, yeah. Um, so we already know this stuff is happening in America, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, hopefully we can make it so that the UK isn't part of contributing to that the way that we do in the UK where we stay away from ABA practices etc the way that we you know we don't condone electric shock treatment for autistics I say in inverted commas so hopefully you know we can be an example and we you know if we can stop it or slow it down or alter research or push autistic led research anything like that we don't have to do it just because other people are doing it. Thank you. They were the main key questions that I thought we hadn't really addressed. So um, I'm sure there's loads more, um, but we've been going for quite a while. We're already quite drained and been quite emotional. Um, so, David, if you've got any and, and, and anybody else on the panel, please let me know in the comment section if you want to add anything. I just wanted to end on, I guess you'd call it a message of hope, but. Um, you know, when you look back at everything that's happened since the beginning of 2020, um, when you th really think about everything that's happened to the world, it's it's kind of overwhelming. Um, and I think S10K, for autistic people at least, has been the straw that broke the camel's back. And I know a lot of you are out there, a lot of us here on this screen are here feeling very alone, very isolated. We're struggling a lot. But I want to remind you all that none of us are actually alone because there is a rich and diverse community that is available to us. And if nothing else, I've seen that community lift each other up time and again, and not just autistic people, but I've seen autistic people lifting up holistic people, neurotypical people. We're a community that cares. And I think all the time we have that, we have something to fight for. So you know, don't give up hope just yet. Thank you. And I think there's a couple of other people who would like to add something as well. Um, where are we? Was that Monique and Priscilla? Priscilla, would you like to add something? Yeah, just to add to the thing about um, the, well, trying to stop a study that maybe can't be stopped. Um, this may seem a bit off tangent, but I just remember the example with the Sia music film, which which was so bloody awful, and everyone was telling her, just please cancel the film, but she went ahead and did it anyway. Um, despite that, I just remember myself personally having so many conversations with people who didn't understand why the film was so problematic, um, and, and really getting a lot out of the conversations because they actually started to understand why we were getting so, like the community was getting so upset. So I think even when you don't sort of stop th things or you know the main thing you think you're going for hasn't happened, there's still a process of, of awareness raising and learning that can go along the way. And you can find yourself having these conversations with people that may not, or you may not have otherwise talked to, you may have not even wanted to talk to because you felt like they were the sort of person who doesn't understand anything or why would I, but you know, you end up having these conversations with people and you end up sort of, you know, just it, enlightening people and, and, and kind of crossing that divide between those people who don't really understand why we're so angry. And 
if that makes any sense but I just <laughs> yeah I think there is hope in, in in anything we do in any sort of awareness raising and um pointing to you know the truth of the <laughs> truth of the situation that we do is it's all important and it all adds up to a growing understanding so yeah Monique? Oh no, it was Kieran's line. He can, I think it was Kieran's line. Um, okay. He can deliver the wonderful message that made me smile. <laughs> um, I just wrote it in the chat. I hadn't intended that everyone said that I have to read it out loud though. Um, just to everyone who's watching, listening, taking part, whatever, whether you're autistic, neurodivergent, however you define yourself, you are all fucking wonderful, complete human beings. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think that's everything. Have I missed anything? Have I forgotten to come to somebody? Okay. Um, I think I've added a bit at the bottom um, in, in our chat that I've just said, Thank you to everybody um, who's helped with this study getting paused. That that wasn't just vague people that we've never heard of. It, it like it has been said, like David said, it was a, a, a concerted effort between autistic people, non-autistic people, you know, making a noise and being really, really, um, you know, um, productive irritants. Um, you know, we all want or should um, aim to try and be like the fantastic late Dinah Murray and be productive irritants. Um, and that's what we've managed to do. We ha and, and I think we all, um, all of you in the comment section, fantastic people have helped to pause this study. And I think that's actually a huge thing to recognise. Um, and, and in terms of what calls to action, um, so people have already mentioned it a few times, which is, you know, sign our letter, sign our statement, sign the um, other petition, which I can't remember where it's on. So if anyone in the chat box has um, in the comments can pop that on. It's also I've listed it actually at the bottom of the statement itself. So you can sign two different petitions in relation to this particular study. Oh, it's a change.org. Thank you, Ira. Um, write your MPs. There is a template for that, too. Um, I think that's all been listed in the comment section. Um, so, yes, thank you, everybody, for everything in the last three weeks for us to get into this stage where we can actually have this study paused while we work out. Have a break. We need a break. Um, a lot of us need a lot of downtime right now. Um, and then we will come back and keep fighting to have this study at least change drastically, even if we can't stop it. Any other final points? I need a sleep and some food. Um, I don't know how to end. It's that autistic awkwardness at the end. What do I do now? <laughs> Say goodbye. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>